Good evening, everyone. I would like to call this regular Board of Education meeting to order. This is Tuesday, January 19th, 2021. And it's uh, just a couple minutes after 5 p.m. And I'd like to welcome everyone that's here um, uh, in the Spring Mills uh, Auditorium and also everyone that's here virtually. Uh, we welcome you and appreciate you taking time to be part of our meeting and to be presenting and uh, other reasons that you're here. but. Again, thank you for being here for tonight for this meeting. Um, I would like to, at uh, this time, uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance, and I would like to ask Dr. Gilpin if he would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, to the, to the republic for which it stands, under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Dr. Gilpin. Uh, item number three on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Uh, before we do that, we have one item to add to the action items and it's the SBA needs grant request. So is there, a, we'll actually show that as item number three under the action item. So is there a motion to approve the agenda as uh, amended? So moved. Second. A motion by Dr. Gilpin, a second by Mr. Beckwith to approve the agenda as amended. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Now, for the first part of our meeting, uh, we have a lot of folks that are here to present uh, for the LSIC for the Spring Mills region. So, uh, Donnie, are you going to uh, lead us off with that? Yes, sir, Dr. Queen. Uh, Dr. Queen and uh, board members, this evening we have a representative from our Spring Mills area schools. I uh, want to thank uh, our uh, principals from the Spring Mills area and also the teams that they have with them, their teachers, their counselors, and uh, their parents and their community members here that uh, will present all the great things that are going on in the uh, Spring Mills area schools. As we said last time with the uh, Hedgesville area, uh, last spring, uh, the Spring Mills areas were able to get their uh, uh, presentation in uh, before uh, the pandemic hit and uh, we were uh, and we were out of school. So you will, what they will be sharing with you will be a combination. They will be sharing a combination of things that have gone on um, in, the, in the past year, but also they'll be sharing what's going on this year and what they are doing to meet the needs to support our students and our staff as we make our way through uh, uh, this year with uh, brick and click instruction. So I'm gonna turn it over to the Spring Mills Area Schools and uh, I um, actually, I forgot, I don't know if it was Jason who was leading the way with it, with the PowerPoint, but uh, take it away. All right, Jason, are you gonna screen share it and then I'll start? Mm -hmm. Jason, can you hear us? Yeah, hold on one second. Um, let's see if I can pull it up. I have to get it on my other.
We're good? Yep. All right. I want to say thank you, Dr. Queen and board members and Dr. Murphy for having us tonight. This evening, you will be listening to the Spring Mills region as we go through our LSIC presentations. This year, we have the great pleasure of welcoming two new principals to our region, Dr. Jessica Alfonso at Potomac Intermediate and Mr. Shane Schaefer at Beddington Elementary. Tonight, I, along with my colleagues, would like to present the incredible things that are occurring in our schools. All right, we're going to start off with Spring Mills Primary. As many of you know, I am Nicole Krause, the principal at Spring Mills Primary. This is my eighth year here at the primary school and my third year as its principal. Spring Mills Primary is only a couple months shy of being a complete decade old. We have the honor this past year to be the feeding site for the Spring Mills region and handing out an average of 800 five day meals every Monday. This today we exceeded it passing out 945. Tonight I will have representing Spring Mills Primary, Megan Salmon, our PTA president and a parent of one of our kindergartners and Brandy Derrickson, who is our art teacher. She is working on her administrative degree from Shenandoah University and will be speaking about our connection with the local colleges. We're going to start off with our click education. Here's a look at our click um, education. We have about roughly 40% of our students um, in click, and we have eight teachers. Tonight, I'm aware that you guys will be hearing a presentation about our virtual learning um, through a video that was made by Miss Gillians, who's shown right here on the screen um, with her safety library. These students who are in our Click Education courses, they have um, iPads and they do daily virtual lessons and assignments using Seesaw. Now I'm going to introduce you to Megan Salmon, and she's going to explain her experience as a parent of a Click student. Thank you, Ms. Krause. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I, like Ms. Krause said, I am a parent to a kindergartner at Spring Wells Primary, and he's virtual. Um, and the beginning of the year, of course, was tough. You know, uh, getting used to everything is always a little challenging, but uh, Ms. Krause and her entire team at the school has made it um, as seamless as possible. Um, they've done a really good job at um, making sure that parents are in the loop about everything um, and they're always open for communication. Um, my son has Miss Gillians, who we absolutely adore. She's done a great job at teaching him how to read and write and learn numbers and shapes and all that fun stuff um, through the laptop or the iPads this year. Um, she's done, there's monthly pickups so that they have worksheets to work on and books and she always includes like little science things and crafts for them to do so they're always manipulating something to work on those fine motor skills. Every morning she does dances and songs so they, you know, they get some energy out and they work on those gross motor skills. Um, she's also done a porch drop off which my son thought was the best thing ever. Um, she also does mm -hmm. um, like little virtual assessments with the kids individually. Um, they have a morning meeting and then they have two small groups during the day. Um, and she's also really great about um, co um, communicating with the parents about what works best for us as far as doing the individual assessments or um, doing the big group meetings and the small group meetings and what works best for each kid. And she really tailors their lessons to what they need individually. So I don't feel like he's missing out on anything being virtual as you know, as if he were in the actual classroom. He's just missing being able to hug and squeeze her, but that's okay. But that's all. Great, we're gonna move on to our brick education at Spring Mills Primary. We have the other 60% of our students are in our brick classrooms. We have 14 teachers servicing these students. We've placed multiple safety precautions in every classroom to ensure the safety of our students and staff. 
Um, this year we implemented iPads throughout the entire school and our BRIC students sort of learn the same technology tools as our CLIC in addition to having the support within the classroom. And here's some pictures of what our students look like um, within the classroom and they're learning. All right, one huge positive thing that we have this year due to COVID um, and our teachers working remotely is the teacher collaboration. Having multiple click and brick teachers in both grad grade levels um, has really enhanced our communication and collaboration among the colleagues. Um, this is evidence in the scores you're about to see. So these next slides. Um, are our star reading and math scores from the first fall benchmark. They are going to take um, the assessments very shortly because the star window has just opened up for the winter. So here you have our second grade reading scores. And as you can see, we are about at 62% of our students are at and above um, reading. Right there. Next, we're moving on for uh, first grade reading. We have about 59% of our students on the STAR Early Literacy that are at or above the assessment level. And again, this was in the fall. Um, and then you can see the breakdown of each level there. Moving on to math. For second grade math, we have about 58% of our students um, that are at or above benchmark here at Spring Mills Primary and first grade is absolutely phenomenal. And I credit our kindergarten for really pushing these manipulatives like Ms. Salmon was saying and really going above and beyond because we had 79% of our students in the fall at or above benchmark in first grade math. All right, I look at our attendance. We have a daily rate you want to move to the next, there you go. Our daily average rate for our fall was 97.58%. And our current absentee rate was a 3.87%. Um, our staff has been really on top of reaching out to parents, encouraging students, conducting home visits, and really making a difference in these unprecedented times. I mean, we have had lots of home visits, lots of collaboration. Really, if, if students are missing two or three days, we're knocking on their door, really making those, um, those communications and those connections with parents um, during this time. It's definitely been key. And our technology has also been important because we use Class Dojo to communicate, Seesaw and school, constant communication with our families. Next, we are a professional development school. Um, one of our strengths is our collaboration here within our building. And we also partner with um, Shepherd University. Um, we use their partnership their partnership to help recruit new teachers in Berkeley County and really show them the multiple programs and tools we use. This past fall, we had 14 Shepherd University students here at Spring Mills Primary. We use a co-teaching model. We conducted a book study by Ron Clark, and we really show them the tools that are being implemented, the different um, literacy model, the math model that we're using in our county. This past um, fall, we were super lucky. We got two of those students that have gone through the multiple programs here at Spring Mills Primary. Um, one just graduated as a new teacher here, and we also have a teacher in residence um, through Shepherd. So we're really building that recruitment and bringing more and more of their students here to Berkeley County. I would like to introduce you to Miss Brandy Derrickson, and she is going to tell you about her experience as a host teacher to a Shepherd University student and also as a current university student working on her degree in administration. So Brandy Derrickson. Hey, good, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Brandy Derrickson. I'm the art teacher at Spring Mills Primary and a member of our LSIC committee. I'm proud to be a teacher at Spring Mills Primary because we put our hearts into education. Not only do we teach our primary level students, but we are involved with providing experience for, experiences for our Spring Mills middle and high school students and working with college students aspiring a career in education. I have had several college students come into my classroom to observe, but never had a student teacher that I worked one-on-one -on -one with until this year. 
This year, I have had a unique opportunity to not only mentor a college student going through the art education program at Shepherd University, but I'm currently a college student myself. I'm working on my administrative and leadership certification through Shenandoah University. Mrs. Krause has taken on the role of being my mentor and I'm very grateful for her help. Being in the position to be a mentor and a mentee simultaneously has helped me to better understand the trials and needs of my student teacher. Together, we face the challenges of schedules that were unknown from one day to the next and the need to create a lesson plan that would not only work with BRIC students, but could be adapted to work with CLIC students. Most importantly, we learn to just stay calm and take things one day at a time. This experience during the last semester has expanded my viewpoints of education through the eyes of many educators. Now I would like to introduce you to a past Spring Mills primary teacher who is now the newest principal at Beddington Elementary School, Mr. Shane Schaefer. All right, good evening members of the board. I want to thank um, Dr. Murphy and the senior leadership and the Board of Education for giving us this opportunity tonight to um, highlight the programs and the great things we're doing at Beddington Elementary School this year. Um, as everyone has said, this is my first year, so this is my first time doing this experience and my first time presenting as a member of the Spring Mills region um, for the LSIC. So bear with me. All right. All right. The, one of the biggest things, these are the, some programs at Bennington Elementary School um, that were in place and some are added since I've arrived. But some of the great things that Bennington Elementary teachers have been doing and our staff is, um, many of our staff members have 10 years or more experience. Um, they were doing monthly monitoring of our student academic progress, which we do through um, what's called CBM is what we're using at this time. And we're moving to, to a system of using Fontanus and Pinnell for guided reading groups. But right now that's what we're using for our monthly monitoring of student progress. We also are using STAR um, as everybody else is using at the primary level. We have weekly data teams and our data teams are set up so our teachers work together. And, um, and I have a, we have a schedule which the staff utilizes um, each week to meet together um, to go over the data. Usually it's, sometimes it's classroom data and sometimes it would be star data. Um, it would just depend on the week. Um, we also have Title I support, which is awesome. I have a full-time interventionist at Bennington Elementary School that's there every day, all day for reading. And we also have a math interventionist that is there two days a week. And those are two huge supports for a small school that are great. And we also, um, through grants have two other interventionists for reading support. So we have a total of four interventionists at our school and that helps us meet the needs of our targeted and our intensive students. Um, one of the other big things that's, that Bennington has that I'm proud of is our strong community support. We have churches. It was, a, it was amazing how many churches reached out to me and there's two particular churches but we've, we've had support from four or five churches this year with donations for food, donations for Christmas, um, clothes, shoes, um, school supplies. Um, it's, it's amazing how much support this little school has from the community. And the other thing that's very important is our business partner, the CNB Bank. They've been wonderful this year. Um, they've donated so many things to our students um, from headphones to food and um, incentives, which we'll, we'll share later on in the presentation. Next, Mr. Yeah, thank you. All right, click students. Um, at Beddington, we only have one click teacher per grade level. That's all we needed right now. So as you see, we got a kindergarten first and a second grade click teacher. And the number of students in each program are highlighted there on the screen. Um, what I think is important to, to point out are some strategies and some things that we are doing at Beddington Elementary. And I think they're similar to those that Ms. Krause is using at Spring Mills Primary School. Um, every day, our teachers are meeting live whole group for math and reading instruction. So our English language arts and our math, we meet every day um, for whole group. But what 
also is important, and I, the parent who spoke, Miss Salmon, for for Miss Krause, pointed out, which is important, is we also individualize instruction for students. We have small group instruction, depending on the needs, and we have one-on-one -on -one instruction. And once again, it depends on the students' needs and the parents' requests. We try to make it it's it's um, available to all students, but it depends on the students' needs, and that's what we have been doing. Also, the students receive targeted and intensive instruction through click through our interventionists if if that is a need as well so those are just some of the needs that that we use for our click teachers um what else is important to point out is we had the funds you know from the county which was available for us to purchase materials for these click teachers so the county did provide funds for me to purchase things such as lighting and just different technology to help each teacher um, be available in an environment for our students where they could actually participate and see the teacher. Um, they also, um, the teachers also have space. The click teachers, I've given each teacher space where they can use and, um, and use, they've used posters and materials that make it available for the, for the staff to communicate with the parents and teachers and the students. We're good for the for the next slide, Mr. Thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce. We have two guests tonight. My first guest is Miss Michelle Butler. Um, she is our kindergarten teacher, and she is our referral agent. And she's going to discuss this slide about our brick students and strategies they have been using um, to keep our students safe and to keep them on target for their academic and um, success. Miss Butler, go ahead. Hey, my name is Michelle Butler and I am the kindergarten, one of the kindergarten brick teachers. And I think it's safe to say this year has definitely been a year of change and flexibility. So we had to change our strategies um, in, a, in order to meet the needs for our BRIC students. So first of all, um, being able to set up our safety protocols and social distancing um, was huge for us, especially in kindergarten, not being able to do our carpet time on the carpet and centers and stations where we would have groups of students. So we had to change our teaching a little bit and adapt to this year. So we started um, focusing more working one on one with the students and having an aide has really been crucial with that with them being able to work one on one with students as well. Um, following back to the basics with our APL strategies and modeling um, all of our things with our kindergarten students because a lot of them had never had iPads before. So we had to model and show them exactly what we wanted from them, knowing that we would go remote eventually. So we had to practice those things with them each day, not only to do activities in the classroom, but practicing with getting on Teams meetings. They had never done that before. Um, also practicing with their seesaw lessons and how to get into their seesaw in Schoology and the team's meeting to be able to join and talk within those meetings. Um, showing them all the apps on the iPad and making them familiar with it. So it took a lot of hands-on um, and one-on-one -on -one instruction and modeling. We also, since we're, we're not allowed to do stations where groups of students are working together because of safety protocols, we created individualized supplies for each student at their desk so that everything that we would normally do in a station, each student had their own little toolkit so that they could work at their own area with their supplies and constantly sanitizing and different things like that. Um, creating one-on-one -on -one assessments for each student and being able to do that weekly um, for our data team meetings as well. So that when we did go remote, we were more prepared and I think the students were more prepared as well. So as Mr. Schaefer mentioned, we do our live meetings daily with the students. We also offer one-on-one -on -one meetings with students and parents. A lot of our um, students are living with grandparents also, and they're not very familiar with the technology. So we've had times where we could go and help them with it or offer to show them how to do it or they could come um, on one of our meetings and we would walk through the process of how we do this on the iPads and different things like that. And also providing paper packets for those students and parents that felt more comfortable with getting actually paper in their hands and not just doing everything on the iPad. So we also provided that as well. Um, 
and I know speaking for all grade levels, not just kindergarten, but we've had to be really creative and we've had to do incorporate a lot of brain breaks and movements and dances and songs, games, things to keep them engaged and actively learning because it's, it's very hard to keep their attention on a screen. And that's for everyone, myself included. So we've had to get really creative with our strategies and also including um, for Christmas, uh, my aide and I, we dressed up as elves and we made um, hats, little elf hats and little stockings with goodies for the children. And we went to their houses to deliver them. So that was something really cool that they could look forward to. So those are just some of the different things that we've done to try to reach out not only with the students, but also with parents and to keep that rapport and to keep them learning. So thank you. All right, next slide. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Great job as always. Okay, these are our fall benchmark scores for Bennington Elementary School. And we started as well with second grade reading. And it's about 65% of the students are where they need to be um, according to that assessment. And 34%-ish are students who are, would require urgent intervention, which I spoke about a little bit with our Title I interventionist. So both students, both groups of students, brick and click, if they qualify for urgent intervention, these students, we are targeting them. And we have um, interventionists, like I said, there's four interventionists, math and reading interventionists that are targeting these students and working in small groups in both brick and click environments. Next slide. First, this is first grade reading, and it's closer to 60% of students that are right there at the benchmark. Um, and then we have about 40% of students who are below the benchmark. If you look at the add above and wa on watch is about 60. And once again, we still have the same interventions in place. And just my experience with STAR testing in first grade, this is a typical students at the first, it's the first time they're really reading an assessment in the fall was always difficult for our students, especially at first grade reading for the STAR assessment. Next. Second grade math, we are almost at 70% of students where they need to be, um, which this was once again for the fall benchmark and we're getting ready to take the winter benchmark. We're actually in the middle of it right now for the winter um, benchmark. And we have about 30% of our students who are getting intervention services through our math interventionist. And next. First grade, as Ms. Krause pointed out, we had a same thing at uh, Bennington. Our first grade math scores are very high, excellent scores. Almost 90% of our students are where they need to be. Um, kudos to Ms. Butler, who's here right now, and Ms. Baker. They are our kindergarten teachers. Um, they're excellent at what they do, and this shows that the students have retained many of their skills that they learned over the summer even, and through the COVID pandemic, that we have 90% of our students where they need to be already um, in first grade. So that's a positive of, of this. All right, um, next. All right, now we're gonna highlight attendance. And um, I, these, these numbers are from December um, 2020 is when I got these. So our average daily rate is excellent, 98.28% of our students attend school on average. And then our chronic absent rate is 5% about, which means about 95% of our students are attending school 90% of the time or more, which is, which is really good at this point. Um, we spend a lot of time at Bennington contacting the parents. The teachers are the first line of defense and they spend time calling parents if their students aren't at school or if they're not on their sessions. Um, also our guidance counselor, I have, I have a, my secretary, um, everybody has, even my specialists, they all support the students' attendance and they've all contacted parents. Um, we've also made visits, many home visits between administration, um, secretaries, guidance counselors, teachers, teacher assistants. Um, there are so many people that are supporting that at our school. And it takes the whole school, honestly, to, to make this, to help to have these great numbers right now. Um, the other thing we, I need to mention is that technology connections, and I think Ms. Krause mentioned those as well, which we use Seesaw as a one avenue to communicate with parents when we need them, if, if they're missing, if a student's missing work or if they're not attending. So besides phone calls, visits, and parents and teachers collaborating, that, that app through the iPad, which the, the, the iPads that every single student has, um, those are another way that we um, communicate with our parents. 
Um, on the next slide, I'm gonna introduce our PTO president. Her name is Mrs. Rebecca Crook and she's been wonderful. And she's gonna share um, some PTO relationships with Beddington and then our community and business partner relationships. So Ms. Crook, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. And thank you, um, board members, superintendents, and distinguished leadership and community members for being here this evening. And it truly speaks on Mr. Schaefer. It takes a village to raise children. And without not only myself, but our business partners, this wouldn't be possible. Attendance is key for any child to learn. You have to give them the seed, to give them the water to grow. Every week, we do do a program where we call Leo the Tiger, weekly incentives to come to school so that if your class is the top of the week, then Leo comes to your classroom and visits one time. And if monthly, whoever puts in the most time in school. So if you are there every single day, you're put into a raffle and each grade level is given a stuffed animal. We call that zoo, zoo, zingo. If I could speak today, it would be great. And lastly, donations from our CMB business partner, they did donate bikes and scooters, as you see here. Scooters was the first semester. And that is for everyone in the entire school. And it is per grade level. So if everyone in kindergarten goes, they give away a scooter. Everyone in first grade is given away a scooter or a bike. So it is very much hands on deck. We've also given away gift cards, luncheons for the teachers because they've endured tremendous in cost this year to keep teaching and be safe for the pandemic. And I thank each and every one of you all for everything that you've done. I'm also a PTO president, but also a proud member of the community with a kindergartner at Biddington and also a third grader at um, Potomac Intermediate. So thank you very much for your time and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Ms. Crook. Um, as Ms. Crook pointed out, the biggest, the, the biggest and best thing about Bennington Elementary School is that community and that business partner relationship that we have developed that's, that was there when I came. So, you know, I just stepped right into that and we just got to continue that relationship and that, that builds, um, like it just, it just, it's the foundation of the school. So I appreciate Ms. Butler and Ms. Crook. I thank you guys for sharing. And thank you to the board and senior leadership. And I'm going to turn it over now to Miss Catherine Worthington of Marlowe Elementary School. All right, thanks, Mr. Schaefer. Um, good evening, board, uh, Dr. Queen, board members, Dr. Murphy and senior staff. My name is Katie Worthington and I'm the principal at Marlowe Elementary School. This is my third year as principal at this wonderful school. We are not a couple months from being 10 years old. We are a couple months from being 100 years old. So we are excited to celebrate that um, anniversary next year. With me tonight, I have two special guests. The first I'd like to recognize is Ms. Kelsey Strelick. She is a second grade teacher, faculty senate president, and LSIC chair. And our second guest this evening is Ms. Amanda Gates. She is a PTA member, LSIC member, and just a thoughtful and very generous parent at Marlowe. Next. First is our click instruction. We have roughly about 270 students at Marlowe and 28% of our students are receiving click instruction. We have one teacher per grade level, pre-K through second, that are click teachers for this school year. These teachers, bless their hearts, they didn't go to college thinking that they were gonna be providing click instruction for an entire school year. But I have to say that they have handled it with grace and class. And um, I'm truly in awe what they do each day in their prep and their organization. I watched um, a few pre-K teachers the other day provide live instruction. And I, I told the one, Mrs. Hikes, I said, you have to be absolutely exhausted when you leave each day to keep the attention of three year old, three to five year olds through singing and dancing and, and constant entertaining um, is I was exhausted watching her. So kudos to those click teachers out there. You're doing amazing things. Next. 
With our brick instruction, we have 72% of our students that are receiving brick instruction. We have five pre-K teachers, three kindergarten, two first and two second grade teachers that provide brick instruction. These teachers and these parents of these students thought these kids would be in the building more this year than what they have been. Um, and once again, I, I just have to say kudos to these teachers for truly being click teachers as well um, for the majority of the year so far. And I would say the success of their instruction has to be their prep at the beginning of the year, working closely with Patsy Hess, um, Jessica Keller to get the technology and logistics of it all together and organized before um, we had to go remote. The collaboration between this, this staff has been incredible and, and working with the parents and their support has been greatly appreciated for sure. Um, the click and brick teachers, when they're all, everybody's remote, many teachers have provided extra hands-on materials for the students to have. So when they're providing their live instruction, they have hands-on tactile things to manipulate, not just their iPads. Um, for instance, we have one pre-K special needs teacher that provides science spins to, and drops them off to their, por their students' porches. Um, and I, I know a little bit about these science spins because she provides one to my, my three-year-old as well. And as much as I appreciate it, it's quite messy science experiments, but that's okay. It's engaging and it's exciting and it's fun. And I know it takes a little extra effort to get those bins ready to drop them off to each student. So um, I just know that the staff is going the extra mile to provide a great education, whether students are in the building or they're getting it at home. And with us tonight is Miss Amanda Gates, and she's going to share her experiences as a parent that signed up for brick instruction, but has received more remote than brick this year. So Miss Gates. Hi, my name is Amanda Gates. I have a student at kindergarten in kindergarten at Marlowe. Virtual learning for me has not been bad. It just has taken a lot of getting used to. I've been very blessed with an awesome teacher this year, surrounded by a great principal at Marlowe. Although I think the kids should be in school setting to learn more and be able to socialize and play on the playground like normal six-year-olds should be able to do. But thanks to COVID, we have no choice but to make this work. Um, from the minute my child gets on, here, um, on his meeting with his teacher until the time the class ends, he is fully engaged with his teacher, is keeping his attention the whole time. The child, my child is able to follow along with the teacher in teaching as he participates with her craziness. <laughs> um, he can tell me afterwards um, what he is learning. Ms. Sorg is doing an amazing job and I appreciate the time and effort it takes her to organize all of these classes and all of these activities for these kids. All right, thank you, Ms. Gates, I appreciate it. Um, and, and with that is just the, the success of the brick and click instruction that we have found at, at Marlowe is the consistency, the structured routine each day, and then once again, family support. Next. As Ms. Mr. Schaefer and Ms. Krause have shared with you already, um, I'm gonna share with you our, our star data for the beginning of the year. Once again, the data that I'm sharing with you is from our fall benchmark. And this is the first assessment that we have taken this year. I wish that I could provide you with growth, um, but unfortunately we are in the middle of that second benchmark window. So I don't have the data um, to show our growth for this year. Um, so at the beginning of the year for first grade reading, 50% of our students were at or above mastery for reading. Next. For second grade reading, 72% of our students were at or above mastery to start the school year off. And another difference between year, the previous years and this year is that students, some students took the assessment in, a, in their home setting. So we have a mix of scores of students who were able to take this test at home and students who took it here at school. And it's a, co a combination between those, those two scores. Next. For first grade math, 78% of our students are the year off at or above mastery. Next. And for second grade math, 76% of our students are the year off at or above mastery, um, which you know, those scores are great. But once again, I like to see where our students are now. And then a concern always are our students in the intervention and the urgent intervention sections. 
Um, we have two part-time interventionists. One is focused on reading, the other focused on math. They're here two days a week each. Um, and then we fo they focus on those foundational skills with the students who may not have missed um, some, some key concepts throughout the years. And so they hone, on, hone in on those individual skills that those students need to help them when they go back into that core setting um, to help them get caught up a little bit with the extra support and time in a smaller group setting. Next. For our attendance this year, it's def definitely been a unique year. Um, so with our average daily attendance is 96%. And our strategic plan goal is to have 90% of our students at Marlowe 90% of the time. Um, so that means that our goal is to have our chronic absent rate at 10%. So we're one percentage above that. And so we are working daily with our attendance worker, our guidance counselor, and our attendance secretary constantly communicating those students who are chronically absent. Um, just like the other couple of schools are doing, we're conducting home visits. We are picking up the phone, making phone calls. And it's really, it goes back to that teacher and that student and that parent relationship and making sure that we're fostering that care of education, providing an engaging education and making sure those students are, are coming to school. Next. All right, next we have um, best instructional practices and our big focus at Marlowe, number one, is, of course, is to make sure students are safe. But number two, our goal is to make sure that our students are provided the best possible education possible and that we're utilizing our time in the most meaningful and purposeful way. So to share some of those best practices, I have Ms. Strelick um, with us this evening. Thank you, Mrs. Worthington. Um, as she said, my name is Kelsey Strelick. I am a second grade brick teacher here at Marlowe. And I wanted to go over some of our best instructional practices that we feel are directly impacting our students learning. The first thing I wanted to highlight was our vertical planning. This is where all K2 teachers meet at least once a month. And sometimes our unified arts teachers join us as well. Um, we take this time to focus on our recovery and focus standards, and we really focus on our strategic, strategic plan to make sure that we are all focusing on the same goal. We're using the same language among our grade levels. That way our students are all familiar with what we're teaching and how that's building upon each other as they progress through their grades. The second thing I wanna talk about is our team planning. This is common in pre-K all the way to second grade. We meet at least once a week with our teams um, and we just take this time to stay connected as a team, share what's going well, what's not going well, share some advice with one another. But again, we also focus on our strategic plan and make sure that our instruction is focused on really what we're supposed to be focusing on um, throughout the school year. The next thing I want to highlight is our reading and phonics units of study. We have five teachers at Marlowe in grades one and two who use this curriculum. Um, I personally use it and I have nothing but high praises for it. Um, we focus on these curriculums, um, it's a newer thing, and we work with uh, Jessica Bowman and Sarah Lewis and they work with us one-on-one -on -one coaching. They also work with us in cohort settings where we focus on each component of the reading model and each component of our curriculum that we're teaching. And they also provide professional development for our staff. I have seen tremendous growth um, with my students. I've seen their love of reading just explode. And I've also seen their engagement and depth of knowledge really expand as I've used this curriculum. So really I have nothing but high praises for this curriculum. Um, next slide, please. The next thing I wanna talk about is our I-Team committee. This is uh, mostly made up of our K-2 teachers. Some of our unified arts teachers have been joining in as well. We meet monthly and we share activities and resources that we can use on our devices and iPads with the students and for their instruction when we are online. Um, we share skills that we've learned maybe with Patsy Hats during one-on-one -on -one PDs or just something that maybe we have learned on our own as we've kind of experimented with creating our own projects. The next thing I want to highlight is our STEM use. 
This is, um, these are activities that we use in our classrooms and even online while the students are at home, just to get them thinking outside of the box and more in depth. Um, kindergarten does this by using uh, morning tubs. They focus on fine motor skills, speaking and listening skills, and they really do things to help the students improve those areas. Our first grade teachers do STEM by creating leprechaun traps, which will be coming up. And they also create musical instruments with household items or items from around the classroom. In second grade, I personally use STEM with something called STEM bins. Um, I just build my students' background knowledge or maybe show them a video of something. And we really focus on how to create this. I give them a task and their job is to either use materials from the classroom or maybe something specific that I give them. And then they have to create it, come up with a blueprint, make a plan, and then actually create it. Um, so you can see on the screen there, the third picture from the left is one of the cards that I use with my students. Um, and that task was to build a boat. So they had to make a blueprint and they had to figure out what materials they wanted to use. Um, the picture on the bottom is the picture of her boat. And then the third or the fourth picture was actually a video that she created explaining all the pieces of her boat and how it was actually able to float when she put it in her sink. So that was really exciting. Um, our protection of instructional time is really a school-wide focus that we have here in Marlowe. It's understood that we are to provide the best instruction from the time the students walk in our doors in the morning until they go home in the afternoon. And same thing now that we're online, we need to be providing the best instruction from the moment they log in in the morning until the time they sign out at the end of the day. Um, and we just really focus on no distractions. We focus on our instruction and we make sure that we are providing instruction all day, every day. Um, our goal right now and all the time is to provide the best possible instruction for our students, whether we are here in the building with students in our classrooms or we are online. And I think that with the collaboration and teamwork and planning that we have among all of our grade levels um, and within our grade levels really shows that we are doing this to the best of our abilities and we are providing the best instruction for our students here at Marlowe. Um, now I would like to pass it over to Dr. Alfonso who is the principal of Potomac Intermediate. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Queen and members of the board, Dr. Murphy and senior administration. Thank you for having us this evening. I am Dr. Jessica Alfonso, principal of Potomac Intermediate School. And I would like to introduce to you, Mrs. Alexandria Hott, a guidance counselor at Potomac Intermediate and our LSIC chair. Also, we have Mrs. Amanda Gates, the leader of our Potomac um, teacher uh, committee parent-teacher committee, who also serves on the LSIC as an appointed community member. Next slide, please. During the 2020-2021 school year, we currently have an enrollment with the student population of 797 students. We have close numbers in all three grade levels enrolled in the brick and click pathways. 244 are enrolled as third graders, 161, 66% are brick, 83, 34% are click, 278 are enrolled in fourth grade, 177, 64% are brick, 101, 36% are click, 273 students are enrolled as fifth graders, 167, 61% are brick, and 106, 39% are click. Our faculty include 33 homeroom teachers, 14 special education teachers, six unified arts teachers, two guidance counselors, one full-time interventionist, one part-time interventionist. We filled 27 vacancies for the 2020-2021 school year. We have 11 school-based mentors with two county assigned mentors. We are focusing on hiring and maintaining highly qualified educators with the goal of increasing our retention rate. 
Our veteran teachers who are school-based mentors have been dedicated to meeting their mentees weekly, offering support, resources, and modeling best practices. They have been demonstrating teamwork and a strong team spirit for their mentees growth for our students' success. We have worked hard to provide equitable services for both brick and click students. Services include instruction, guidance, intervention supports, special education supports, including gifted and speech pathology and unified arts instruction. We have continued to host all vital operational meetings, IEPs, 504s and SAT through Teams. To address our strategic plan goal number one, academic excellence. By June 2021, 100% of grades three through five students will be reading and performing on grade level or make more than one year's growth in reading and math according to the STAR assessment. Additionally, by June 2021, 100% of teachers will implement the Berkeley County Schools literacy model and guided math model consistency, consistently at a level measured by walkthroughs, lesson plans, and observations. We have been checking lesson plans, conducting walkthroughs, and conducting observations and hosting post-observation conferences. On October 9th, classroom teachers used the annual progress report and instructional class report in Renaissance to develop guided groups and identify focus needs in alignment with West Virginia State curriculum. November 30th through De December 2nd, administration with the school psychologists and interventionists conducted data review talks and conveyed compelling conversations with each classroom teacher to analyze the quantitative data, gather qualitative data, and identify patterns in student behavior and academic needs among the brick and click environment. Teachers were able to set a year's growth for each student and were encouraged to host their own data review talks and compelling conversations with students to encourage their best performance for the winter and spring benchmark assessment. Next slide. For third grade reading, 54% of our third graders were at or above proficiency. For third grade math, 65% of our third graders were at or above proficiency. Next slide. For fourth grade math or reading, 65% of our students were at or above proficiency. And for fourth grade reading, 60, or sorry, math, 63% of our fourth grade students were at or above proficiency. Next slide. For fifth grade reading, 52% of our students were at or above proficiency. And for fifth grade math, 57% of our students were at or above proficiency. At this time, I would like to introduce Mrs. Alexandria Hott, who will be discussing our goals, action steps, and current results for discipline, attendance, and health and wellness. Next slide. Good evening, Dr. Queen and members of the board, Dr. Murphy and senior administration. Thank you for having us this evening. I am Ms. Alexandria Hott, a school counselor at Potomac Intermediate and the 2020-2021 LSIC chair. Goals related to discipline include that by June 2021, 90% of all students will have met tier one PBIS standards, therefore not receiving any formal discipline actions. By June 2021, all students will receive behavior interventions for all level one and level two behaviors before formal discipline measures are taken 100% of the time. As of January 2021, eight students, which is less than 1%, have received formal disciplinary action through a Revis referral compared to 40 students for the first quarter of the 2019-2020 school year. One student has been suspended thus far during the 2020-2021 school year. Discipline programs and initiatives include infraction forms, which documents in-class interventions that are prior to Revis referrals, quarterly rewards with clearly defined eligibility criteria, which we call our wing fling, PBIS matrix, which is utilized to teach proper behaviors and procedures, monthly meetings to discuss discipline data, team support for novice teachers, and positive referrals. Goals related to attendance include that by June 2021, 90% of our students will attend school at least 90% of the time, and that no more than 10% of students will miss 10% of the time. As of March 2020, 12.2% of students were chronically absent, and as of January 2021, 7.8% of students are chronically absent. 
Continued plans to address attendance issues include our attendance team that is composed of school counselors, an assistant principal, and our attendance worker conducting a weekly review of attendance reports and action plans based on individual cases. Home visits, legal notices, class dojo points for active participation in the full remote environment, and APL strategies such as random selection and the pass option. Meaningful family contacts from teachers, counselors, administrators, and the attendance worker lead to the understanding of the barriers that are preventing attendance. Some of these barriers include device issues, internet connectivity issues, economic hardships, relocation, and as a result, our staff has been able to support families to overcome these barriers. Next slide, please. To address social, emotional, and physical health and well-being, we have implemented the following system as, as Potomac Intermediate School. Our virtual counseling offices, Away is Bullying Prevention Program, Project Aware, classroom counseling lessons for brick and click classes that are aligned with the West Virginia Student Success Standards and Ask a Mindset and Behavior Standards, Kids Power Pack Food Program, and Community Resources. Patterns of guidance needs include social and emotional needs, anxiety, stress, grades, uh, the remote learning, need for coping mechanisms, and as a result, our staff is equipped to support, give resources, and immediately work to address the needs. At this time, I would like to introduce Mrs. Amanda Gates, who will be discussing our goals and action steps for parent and community involvement and communication at Potomac Intermediate School. Next slide. Good evening, Dr. Queen and members of the board, Dr. Murphy and senior administration. Thank you for having us this evening. I am Amanda Gates, the leader of Potomac's Parent Teacher Committee, and I serve on the LSSC as an appointed community member. Goals related to parent and community communication include, by the 2021 climate survey, parents' responses will have more positive feedback with 42% more responses in either agree or strongly agree. In 2019, parent responses showed 30% undecided 7% disagree, and 4% strongly disagree that the principal is approachable. Using school communication tools will increase parents' response of, I think the school keeps parents well informed about what the school is doing by 8%. In 2019, 2020, 67% of parents agree with the statement on the Potomac School Climate Survey. To address these goals, the administration has worked hard to communicate well with parents and the Potomac school community. The images within the weekly Potomac family updates and other topics related to the 2020-2021 school year, which include introduction of the new principal and assistant principal, iPad dis distribution, click updates, mitigation guidelines, encouraging active participation in full remote environment. Other sources of communication include schoolology messages, class dojo messages, emails, phone calls, and team meetings. Next slide, please. Administration has worked hard, worked closely with the PTC to implement small yet consistent practices that will increase school morale and continue to foster a positive school climate. Some of the ways the PTC and other community members have assisted with providing are the following. A Chick-fil-A lunch, service personnel day with Dunkin' Donuts, lesson plan check treats, school spirit apparel, polo shirts with new rebranded logo, Bigger, bigger quarterly treats with teachers for teachers at the end of every nine weeks, and faculty senate and distant learning day lunches. It has been a pleasure to work with the 2020-2021 administrative team and the staff at Potomac. Thank you for the opportunity to share some of the, the great things that has happened at Potomac Intermediate School. Next is Dr. Ponton of Spring Mills Middle School. Thank you very much. Good evening, Dr. Queen, members of the board, Dr. Murphy, and senior staff members. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight about the great things taking place at Spring Mills Middle School. My name is Tony Ponton, and I am in my second year as principal at Spring Mills Middle School. I have with me tonight Ms. Wendy Kaiser, one of our sixth grade ELA teachers and a member of our LSIC, and Mr. Josh Hikes, a parent and also a member of our school's LSIC. Next, please. Currently, we have 884 students enrolled at Spring Mills. You can see the breakdown for click and brick by get grade level. Uh, School-wide, that breaks down to about 60% of our students on brick and about 40% of our students on click. 
We also have 91 staff members supporting the needs of our students, and of those, 57 are teachers. Next. Because we did not take the GSA last year due to COVID, our teachers have placed a priority on STAR benchmark data when assessing student achievement and growth. We use the data from our STAR assessments in school-wide data teams meetings. During these meetings, our staff members collaborate to analyze ways to improve student achievement. We also utilize a full-time interventionist who will meet with our, our students who need targeted interventions based on these STAR scores. And to su support their efforts, our teachers also use two county-funded online programs, IXL and ExactPath, that provide weekly practice in both math and reading. These programs also provide growth and achievement data for our teachers to use in data teams for curriculum and instructional planning. Our teachers also use the IMAs or the interim module assessments for extra practice in both ELA and math. The content in the IMAs are aligned with the standards measured by our end of the year GSA. They use the same platform as the GSA, so it allows our students the opportunity to practice using that platform before they take the GSA in the spring. While we have been on remote learning, our teachers are also available during specific days in the afternoons on teams to provide tutoring and support for our students. These next few charts that you're gonna see are our most recent fall star assessment scores. On these charts, green is good. It means that we are at or above benchmark. What I'm sharing with you tonight is the percentage of students at each grade level at or above benchmark in both our star math and reading tests. As you can see, for our sixth grade scores, we are at 46% in math and 40% in reading. Switch, please. For seventh grade, we are 47% in math and 42% in reading. Next, please. And for eighth grade, we are 48% at or above benchmark in math and 44% in reading. Our students are currently taking their next STAR test and our teachers will use the data in the data team's meetings and when collaborating on their planning to compare growth between the two testing windows and they're gonna make instructional decisions and adjustments based on those results. Next. These are our current attendance numbers for this school year. Our current chronic absence rate is 4.77% compared to 19.86% last year. And our daily attendance rate is 97.47% versus 93.03% last year. We've put a lot of focus on making contact with our students who are not attending either brick or click classes or when we are remote, not coming to class as well. Our teachers, our counseling department, our admin team, and our county attendance worker all make regular phone calls to students who do not attend class. And this year, Ms. Wapara, our assistant principal who oversees attendance, created a school, line, school online communication log that allows any of our staff who had a, have a hand in addressing attendance the opportunity to see who students' parents have been contacted about attendance and when that contact was made. So far, we have made over 280 contacts to parents about attendance, either through home visits or phone calls. And these contacts let parents know about attendance, uh, what we can do to support them, and if we can get them extra support such as internet or county tutoring services. Next. Oh, there we go. All right. This year, perhaps more than any other year, how we address our students' social, academic, and emotional needs is paramount to their academic achievement and emotional well being. And communication with parents is key. Not only do we make parent contacts for attendance, but our teachers, counselors, and administrators have made over 600 parent contacts concerning academic performance including last week in which our counseling department made approximately 170 contacts to parents whose students received low grades on their second nine weeks interim reports. During those contacts, a number of supports were offered to the parents and students, including school and county tutoring, parent-teacher conferences, and SAT referrals. Our counselors also received a number of requests from staff and students to check in on students about whom they might have a specific concern. This request could have been made due to a student's social media post or a sudden change in a student's behavior or academic progress. Our counseling team will conduct a well check either in person or online with both the parent and student and offer supports such as Project AWARE. Our counseling department has also worked hard to ensure that many of the programs that we normally provide for our students continue this year. 
Our students participated in Oveas Week, Red Ribbon Week, and Job Exploration Week. Although the programs and activities for these events were online this year, they still provided a fun and engaging opportunities for our counselors to support the needs of our students. We also provide food weekly for more than 50 students through our Kids Backpack Program. And finally, it's important that we recognize excellence from our students, no matter what year. And we have continued to celebrate our students' successes through our nine weeks Patriot Awards, in which our staff select one student each nine weeks, and that student is recognized for excellence in academics, behavior, and attendance. In the last, next week, last nine weeks, we celebrated the achievements of 42 students, and we will acknowledge another round of Patriot Award winners early next month. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Wendy Kaiser, who'll talk to you a little bit about instruction during COVID here at Spring Mills Middle School. Thank you, and thank you members of the board for the opportunity to speak this evening. I wanna share with you the ways our staff at Spring Mills Middle School provides instructional support to all our students and families, and how we have adopted a number of technology tools to adapt to the evolving needs of our students that, with, with this unique school year. I am part of the sixth grade team. My team is flexible when working with students and parents, even meeting with them after school hours and on weekends. Sometimes just returning a message to a student or a parent after hours can have a big impact. Something I do to normalize the classroom environment while teaching my students virtually is to show CNN 10 student news and share the principal's updates each day. These are things that would happen in the brick and mortar setting on a normal school day. At Spring Mills Middle, we use a variety of instructional platforms to meet the ever-changing educational needs of our students as well. We have transitioned all of our assignments online and will likely keep most of them that way in the future. We use Schoology as the primary platform for our instruction. Our teachers have been diligent in learning the new platforms so they can better instruct our students both in person and virtually. A resource that math teachers use is Extra Math. Extra Math is an individualized program that is free to have students practice their math facts. Math Antics is also a source math teachers use for instructional videos. Our science teachers use Gizmos as an online resource. On Gizmos, teachers can search for lessons by academic standards, grade, or topic. It offers online simulations for math and science. A universal resource we use is Kami. Kami can be used by all subject areas. Kami allows teachers to upload PDF versions of their assignments to Schoology, and students can then open the assignments in Kami manipulate them and type on them and send them back to their teacher to be graded. My Rights is an online resource that has changed the way student writing is graded and feedback is given. My Rights has been a great resource to have in the English classroom, but it can be used by a teacher of any subject. Teachers can use the prompts that are already created or they can create their own. My Rights also gives students immediate feedback on their writing and allows them to correct their mistakes. My Rights also gives several reports for teachers to view and students can also see their progress throughout the year. Nearpod is another platform that can be used in all subject areas. Nearpod has lessons in every subject and grade level. Nearpod allows teachers to use their lessons or a teacher can create their own. Teachers have the option of doing a, a teacher or student led lesson. Teachers can view a report at the end of each session to see student engagement and a mastery of that a subject. I use several assessment and practice platforms with my students. I love to use them because I see excitement from my students. One is Kahoot and the other is Quizzes. I have used both of them virtually as well and they work out great. I use them as a review for actual assessments that students will do in my class. At Spring Mills Middle School, we seek out things to use with our students to help them to become successful in learning. When we do that, we share with others on our teams or in our subject areas. A few that I've had success with, success with using is in ELA is Quia, Jeopardy Labs, and Quizlet. At times, I've had students complete online assignments, get the results, and then practice more before uploading a screenshot of their work. By doing this, I can ensure they are getting the practice I would like them to have on a particular topic um, to master that topic. Thank you, and at this time, I'd like to introduce Mr. Hikes. He'll be speaking about how Spring Mills Middle School engages with our community. Hi, my name is Josh Hikes. Uh, I'm an LSIC member at Spring Mills Middle. Um, every morning, Dr. Potton sends out a video through Schoology, letting students know what schedule they are on and giving brief announcements and weekly updates uh, through Schoology, in touch, and a school Facebook page. Uh, Ms. Wapara, one of our assistant principals, does weekly shout outs through Schoology, where teachers from each grade nominate students who go above and beyond in academics and participate well during their online meetings. Uh, each student nominated receives a certificate and a winner is randomly drawn from each grade level 
uh, to win a gift card that was donated uh, by local businesses that Ms. Wapara went to personally uh, to get those donations. Uh, teachers also receive shout outs and are nominated by other staff members as well and get gift cards in Spring Mills Middle Gear. Um, during uh, the Christmas time, uh, our school worked with Centerpoint Church, one of our business partners, to provide Christmas meals and presents for 83 students. Uh, we provided each student a jacket, backpack, and one specific gift that they were asked they had asked for, plus one board game for each student and several other gifts as well. Um, during our Veterans Day celebration, uh, we would normally have a bunch of people in the school um, in an assembly, and this is an extravagant ex celebration of our community's patriots. Um, however, this year, COVID prevented us from having our usual celebration. So instead, we did a video tribute to our veterans that showcased our students' singing and writing abilities and posted it on social media. Uh, we also collected donated items for our veterans who are at the Martinsburg VA Medical Center through an Amazon wish list where people could purchase items and have them shipped directly to the VA Center. Uh, we do have regular LSIC meetings uh, that are quarterly meetings, and they are, we're looking to eventually expand these meetings to include our students at, at the meetings as well. Uh, we use these meetings as an open forum for parents to know what is going on in our school and to be able to give feedback. Um, during the Christmas uh, time period, uh, we also decided as an LSIC to create a Facebook group for parents and had 80 parents join. We wanted to be able to do something to thank our teachers. Uh, we were able to give uh, goodie bags to the 91 staff in the school with things like coffee mugs, full-size candy bars, individual bags of chips, post-its, wipes, pens, highlighters, and cheesy sayings such as, you're all that in a bag of chips, to show them uh, that parents appreciate them and what they are doing for our kids. Next year, uh, we were hoping to get the Watch Dogs program uh, up and running this year, but next year we are looking to get that going. Uh, DOG stands for Dads of Great Students, and uh, the program gives dads and positive male role models an opportunity to show kids that dads think education is important, helps with anti-bullying, gives an extra set of eyes and ears in the hallway, and just gives an extra added sense of security overall as well. Uh, I would like to now turn the presentation over to Mr. Kamlowski, principal of Spring Mills High School. Uh, good evening, Dr. Queen. Uh, members of the board, Dr. Murphy, uh, Mr. Dellinger, and all the senior staff who's here, I just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about the great things going on in the Spring Mills region. I've got uh, Carla Hilliard with me this evening. Uh, we are going to talk about our COVID team and how that led up to uh, the start of the school year. Um, it's been kind of a unique year at the high school level um, with COVID and, and having to make adjustments to that. Um, just to start out, our, our school population is growing. We are one of the fastest growing high schools in the entire state of West Virginia. Uh, we're nestled up right there next to 1,400 students. We will actually push past that next year uh, for the first time in our, in our brief history. Uh, as you can see this year, we have about a 50-50 split. It, it started out the year 50-50. It's closer to 55-45 um, right now between brick and click. Uh, if I had to say what the, the biggest challenge has been this year, uh, it was definitely preparing for uh, students coming back in a pandemic uh, and trying to solve the the brick and click equation. Um, uh, we were lucky enough to have Carla with us uh, during that time whenever we were planning for kids to come back. Uh, we had just lost Josh Sowers to the transportation department and we needed an extra set of eyes with us uh, and Carla as an aspiring administrator was gracious enough to join us uh, and we were able to to come up with a master schedule um, that kind of fit our needs pretty well. Um, and, and we believe didn't put too much stress on the teachers or, or try to minimize the, the amount of stress on the teachers. Um, but we have a, a pretty solid split. Uh, we're excited potentially to get kids back here in the near future. Um, you know, we love our kids. We love having them in school. Um, I, I posted on Twitter last spring, you know, it's a, it's an awesome building. It's a beautiful facility, but really it's just a pile of bricks without the kids being there. Uh, as you can see, our, our minority population continues to grow. Uh, we are over 24% right now. Last year, we were um, just a shade over 23%. So we're growing in that area as well um, with new housing in the area. Um, comes a bunch of new families. We're really proud of our minority population at Spring Mills. We think it's one of the best kept secrets about our school and our community. Uh, we have kids from all different walks of life. Uh, and it's something we really embrace up there at 499 Campus Drive. 
our graduation rate last year was over 95%. Uh, that is, I believe, the fifth straight year we've been over 95% at Spring Mills. Um, a big reason for our success with graduation rate uh, has been a lot of the after school programs we have um, between Grad Point, uh, which is headed up by our counseling department and, and Rose Wolfrey, uh, Saturday School, which uh, in the past, Mr. Sowers and, and Mr. Salfia and now Mr. Wilson are heavily responsible for. Um, and, and just different things we do with with even after school tutoring. Uh, and, and we have a whole plethora of teachers that are willing to work with kids. Um, you know, after school in different capacities, not just in academics. I mean, we have a number of clubs and things like that. Uh, and we strongly believe that that the more kids are involved, uh, the more likely that they'll be successful with, at the high school level. Uh, and, and so we, we try to get kids involved in, in some kind of sport or club. I'm um, happy to report that last year we had uh, over 800 kids who were either involved in a sport or a club of some sort. Uh, and we hope to continue to grow that number um, in the near future. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about our test scores and uh, the numbers you're going to see on the screen over the next couple of slides are from the um, fall SAT school day that we just took back in October. And I've really got to tip my cap to uh, Dr. Kerry Markham. Um, because we pulled off testing um, almost 100, it was 160 kids on the middle of a pandemic, many of which showed up that day uh, for the first and only time being in school because we had quite a few click kids who came in um, to test. And, and what we saw that day was really a, a whole team effort uh, in the building between um, the kids actually showing up on time and despite it being new and different for them, uh, figuring out where to go. Um, bus drivers doing a great job of getting the kids in there on time. Uh, our cooks did a fabulous job of feeding everybody. You know, at the end of the day, it was kind of a scramble because of the length of the test versus, you know, the shortened school day this year. Um, we had some um, logistical issues there, but our cooks were able to change on the fly. Uh, Dream and the girls did, in the back do a wonderful job with that. Um, but then our staff, you know, we had so many teachers that, that were in the hallways and, you know, because we had kids who, who were also in, in class that day and we were having to reroute them. You know, and when you consider that that this year for school, you know, we're only walking one direction in the hallways and there's certain parts of the building they can't go in. Uh, it, it really took all. Uh, 147 members of the of the Springfield High School staff to pull this off, but you know the kids, as you can see on the screen, uh, did an absolutely tremendous job. Uh, knocked it out of the park this year. Uh, in English, uh, our our scores for the first time ever um, were right above the national average, um, which is something we've really worked hard on there uh, and, and made a, a point of emphasis for us. And, you know, when you talk about the national average, and, and this is always what we look at, you know, these, these are the kids that our kids are competing against for jobs and scholarships and, and colleges. Uh, and we're really proud of the fact that our kids were able to perform as well as they did in English. And in our English department, um, they kind of took it personal last year when we looked at our test scores. So um, the kids did a tremendous job. Uh, English teachers did a tremendous job, you know, and one of the goals whenever I came into the school two years ago was to be the top performing high school in English and math. Uh, and we were able to accomplish that in the fall. So we're proud of that. Um, as for our math benchmark scores, and you'll see we're still lagging behind the nation uh, in math, but we were above the, the county and state average, uh, which was also required for us. We actually increased our math scores uh, 30, per, or, uh, 30 points total um, from the spring of 2019. And, and, and one of the biggest things for us was, you know, last spring, our kids lost essentially an entire nine weeks. So we weren't sure what that was going to mean um, for this fall benchmark testing. And, and when the kids came into it, um, you know, we, we was kind of one of those things where we were, we were hoping for the best and preparing for the worst. Um, but as you can see, I mean, the kids absolutely knocked it out of the park. Um, this is a this is an entire school day snapshot that kind of compares our numbers and, and might help you to see this uh, and it's a better visual. Um, our our school average mean score. So whenever you ask a kid what they got on the SAT, you know, last year we we had um, um, Davis Funk. He he got a a, a sixteen hundred. He got a perfect. Our kids averaged over a thousand. Um, on the SAT this year. Again, first time in school history. And as you can see, our district in general did an outstanding job. Uh, our schools, our four county high schools averaged over a thousand. Um, but again, um, you know, over the national average uh, in reading and English and uh, above the county and state average in math and, and, you know, still have work to do. Uh, but one thing I want to highlight is, and, and I talked about this last year, you know, with our math focus was getting IXL into our classrooms. And, and one of the keys to this has been, we implemented this at Spring Mills last year as a pilot program 
Um, and when they came to us at the end of the year and they asked us what some of the programs were <clears throat> that we'd like to see at a, at a county level, uh, IXL was one of the things that, that you all um, invested in. And we're excited about that. It's been a huge asset, especially during pandemic learning, because this is something that kids can do on their phones. They can do it on their Chromebooks. They can do it on an iPad. Uh, and, it, and it's an easy thing for them to do, you know, nine or 10 math problems while, while they're just sitting at home um, any day of the week. And, you know, we believe strongly that, that IXL has really helped um, our math scores improved. And, and last year, as part of my professional goals, um, one of the goals I had was, was for our school to, to improve our, our scores by 30 points in math. Um, so we did reach our score or our, our goal there. So really excited that we've continued to use IXL. Um, you know, our, our kids have, have went over, um, I believe the number was 43,000 total questions answered so far this year, which is tremendous. Um, you know, the teachers are using it. They're using it as a tool. They're using it as an aid. Um, you know, we were able to hire, uh, four more um, certified math teachers this year. So now we're, we're really down to only two um, uncertified math teachers. And the two that we have are uncertified. Both have very strong math backgrounds. Uh, so we've, we've really made math an area of focus um, and, and a point of emphasis in our school. And I, and I think the results are starting to bear themselves out. I know our math department head, Rose Wolfrey, is a very proud person. Um, and she's really pushed her department. And, and I just really appreciate the work that they've done. Uh, next, we're going to look at, at some attendance numbers. And Last year, we talked at the LSIC um, presentation that, that our attendance had definitely improved uh, in, in the first couple of months that I was principal. Um, this year's numbers are obviously, um, you know, a little bit skewed by the fact that, that we've been virtual um, for, so, for so much of the year. We are, we are averaging um, over 97% on our attendance rate this year, which um, is a little bit of an uh, anomaly. But what we've seen is when we are brick, uh, our BRIC students are still showing up. And over the past couple of weeks, probably the last actually six weeks, going even back into December since we've been on remote learning, um, we've been reaching out to kids um, each week to check in. And we have a focus group of kids that we've been bringing in. And the feedback that we've gotten from parents is these kids are dying to get back in school. Um, and, and they want to do it when, when they're safe. But the feedback is that the kids actually miss being in school. Um, which tells me that we're doing a lot of things right at the high school level because we want kids to be there. And we have, and this is kind of a shared responsibility for us. Uh, we have counselors making phone calls. We have teachers making phone calls. We have admin making phone calls. But what we've done the last couple of weeks is we've had our autism aides um, on the days when special ed kids aren't there. And even on the days that they are, um, you know, they're taking turns making phone calls for us um, to, to, to bring certain kids into the building to get some help um, you know, with us in, in a small group capacity, which, which has been a huge thing. And that really speaks to the fact that we all take ownership of attendance because we understand that the kids are only going to be successful if they're in the building. And, and you can see where our chronic absences have, have went way down, which again, uh, you know, those numbers are skewed a little bit by the fact that, you know, we're doing so many things with remote learning, but I, I do feel that we've been trending the right way with regards to attendance, um, in the past year and a half since, since I've been there. Uh, and I really have to give a ton of credit to um, Mark Salfi, Eric Wilson, um, and Josh Sowers before he left. I mean, they are absolutely relentless with these kids on the phone, um, meeting with kids, meeting with parents. Um, I mean, nary a day goes by when, when those guys are not picking up the phone and calling, you know, 10, 12, 15 parents uh, of kids who are attendance issues, even just to check in. Um, they work that into conversations about discipline. Um, they even work that into conversations about grades. So it, it's, a, it's a staff effort with attendance. Um, Audrey Munyon has done a tremendous job for us. She goes on home visits almost um, you know, weekly. We've sent uh, Jayla Crane out on home visits to see students. We've sent Crystal Copenhaver out. Um, both, you know, two counselors have went out on home visits. Um, and, and again, you know, it takes a village to get these kids raised. And, and that's really what we're trying to do is just share the responsibility with everybody. Um, and, and I think we're starting to see some results from that. Uh, you can see we're still number one among BCS high schools for our, for our attendance. Um, you know, and this just, just speaks to the continuous communication I was talking about with Mr. Salfi and Mr. Wilson. Um, we do have a community and schools person again, Tracy Long. She's been tremendous. Um, we just met with um, the head of the community and schools for the county on Friday to try to implement a couple other programs that are, that are hopefully going to help us um, with attendance and grades over the next um, 15 to 18 weeks. 
Um, our minority attendance is higher than the school average, which is something we're super proud of. Um, we feel that's a big time net positive because that is actually um, a different trend than most of the nation has. Uh, our low SES attendance still needs some work. And, and this is a question that we're really trying to ask because those kids um, that come from you know, low income backgrounds, um, their chronic, ab chronic absent rate is almost three times on what the school average is. So we're trying to figure out that question um, and how to get those kids to school. You know, what we've run into this year is we've got kids that are working at Walmart, Popeye's, Sheets, Burger King, uh, and we're having to have a conversation with them like, hey, you know, come to school. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're having to fight the battle of, hey, I'm making money to help my family. So, you know, every year brings its own set of questions. Um, and we're trying to find answers to those questions. And we'll continue to, uh, to work on that for the rest of this year and then, and then continue to chip away at it next year. Um, but this is kind of the, the big part of the presentation. And, and Carla is going to speak to you guys in, in a second. Um, but last April, uh, whenever it was last March, whenever we went out, um, we developed a team at Spring Mills High School to prepare to come back to school in August because there was no doubt in our mind that we were gonna be back with kids. And we got together uh, virtually every Friday. And my thing with them is we're gonna discuss the muck while we're in it. And it kind of started out as therapy for us. Yeah, every Friday we would get together and we would talk about successes and failures. We we'd talk about you know what might be working, what might not be working. Uh, but the biggest thing is, and I went back through some of our notes from these meetings, you know, we just prepared for so many of the unknowns um, of coming back, you know, into a school year with a pandemic. And, and I think it was really uplifting for a lot of teachers because they were able to give us feedback and we were able to hear from them, um, from the people on the front lines with it every day. And, and they talked about their challenges and they talked about their victories. And, and the biggest thing, you know, that I wanted them to do was understand we're going to talk about this while we're in it. So that way we can figure out how to make it better and we can figure out what works and what doesn't. Uh, and that way in August, when we're putting together the ultimate plan, we're not trying to look back um, with rose colored glasses on what it was like in the spring. Uh, and, and it was so valuable to, to us to come back to school this year. And Carla is going to speak more to that. Um, but for us to get a plan together to work to Spring Mills High School. So I'm gonna let Carla talk a little bit about that on um, what that was like for her. Hi everyone, good evening. Uh, thank you for this opportunity for us to share the good work that's happening, not only at Spring Mills High School, but on the Spring Mills campus. My name is Carla Hilliard. I teach English 11 and AP Literature and Composition at Spring Mills High School. Um, so as Mr. Kamalski was saying, we developed a, a COVID planning team made up of teachers, counselors, special education teachers, administrators. And um, I think this process has been really valuable in our planning um, and reflection on our experiences in the spring and then how to better prepare for this fall and the remote learning that we've been experiencing this past semester. Thank you. So um, the COVID planning team, um, in my opinion, or in my view as a teacher, has really focused on collaboration and teacher leadership. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity, although we had to be distant from one another, it really created this opportunity for teachers to come together. And um, everyone knows that when teachers come together and work together, we are just stronger together. Uh, when we share ideas, when we collaborate, um, it builds us up. Um, we have an opportunity to share best practices. And this of course is all for the benefit of our students. Um, the best part about this process, and like Mr. Kamlowski was saying, we started meeting early um, last spring. Uh, we were not very far into the process after we were um, placed in the remote learning situation last year that we started having these weekly calls. We met throughout the summer and we've continued these meetings in the fall. Um, but we were problem solving in real time. So we were able to bring the problems to the group, to troubleshoot them, um, but our priorities uh, remained uh, student feedback and best practices. So um, for student feedback, several of us on the team uh, would uh, survey our students. We would share those uh, survey results with the staff, uh, with one another on the team. We wanted to get a better sense of what was working for students, what was not working for students, uh, what we could improve, um, what we could, uh, what we could do better, how we could be better for our students, how we could be more present for them, uh, because of course this was brand new, and so we were truly building the bike while we were riding it. Uh, we talked about best practices for remote learning at the high school level, and I think Mr. Kamlowski did a great job highlighting 
the difficulties and the complexities of being a high school student in a fully remote situation the school uh, in during a typical school year, uh, they're balancing jobs, um, they have younger siblings, uh, family obligations, sharing devices. Many of our students face these challenges, but I think for some of our older students, they are in a unique situation. So what we heard from students is that they really appreciated short instructional videos. Um, they um, respond well to clear and frequent communications and that flexibility is key. So um, being generous with our students, um, working with them individually, treating every student as an individual with an individual set of circumstances, uh, we had a lot of conversations um, about how to reach our students. We had sustained conversations and ongoing conversations about grading practices um, and class sizes. Um, thinking about uh, what was fair, what was equitable, and what benefited our students. And um, safety, of course, has been uh, the chief concern among all of this. Uh, but like teachers, you put teachers together in a room or a Zoom room, we're going to talk about the best way uh, to reach and teach our students, but all that under the umbrella of safety. Um, we also, uh, many, many of our COVID uh, planning conversations focused on equity with regards to resource distri distribution, um, ensuring that our students had the appropriate devices, um, internet connectivity. We wanted to be really sensitive to their needs um, so students could be successful, uh, meeting students where they were, providing them opportunities, extended time, um, thinking creatively, finding new solutions to, I think, what are old problems uh, for students maybe disengaging or not completing work or turning assignments in on time. Um, this um, context of COVID created new opportunities for us to problem solve um, and to think creatively. Um, we talked a lot as well about how we continue to provide rich educational opportunities because we want our students to be critical and independent thinkers. Um, and the last couple points here, um, I really want to emphasize because um, our administrators at Spring Mills, Mr. Kamlowski, Mr. Salfia, uh, Dr. Markham, uh, uh, Mr. Sowers at the time and now Mr. Wilson, they have um, prioritize mental health for our students and for staff. I think this is really important because teachers at Spring Mills High School feel valued, they feel empowered, um, they have a voice, um, and this COVID planning team, I, I think, is a direct result of that. Uh, so we did spend a lot of time um, thinking about mental health for our students um, and treating, and again, just emphasizing treating every student as an individual in an individual with individual needs. Uh, so we continue to have these conversations. We just had a meeting today. Uh, we continue to refine our process uh, to help our students um, um, achieve their potential. And um, I really appreciate, again, our administrative staff um, giving teachers the opportunity to provide input um, for how we approach education this year. Thanks, Carla. Um, and, and just to touch on a, and highlight a couple things, um, we we got Miss Hilliard involved when we were when we had to rebuild our master schedule, and and her input as a teacher uh, was so valuable to us because she she had a perspective that the the four administrators. Um, that we're working on that we just didn't have because we we are we are removed from a classroom and she had the genius idea of you know once we kind of had our classes put together and, and what pool of classes we had uh, we brought in our various departments into school and and we put it up on a board and honestly it was kind of like an apollo 13 when when they roll out the stuff and they say hey we have this and we've got to make this fit into this um, and that's what we told the teachers you know here's what we have and we got to make this end fit into this end tell us how to do it uh, and, and we empower them to do that. And, and I really do believe that's why this has worked out so well is because, because we gave our teachers a voice, not only in how we were going to do this, but literally what they were going to teach this year, uh, which I think is important uh, because that gives them ownership of the building. And, and in a school like Spring Mills that is so new and, and we're still trying to find our way and find our identity, uh, the best way to do that is to give your teachers ownership of the building. Um, a couple of things just talking about culture and community. I really have to give a hat tip to, to Mr. Comer, our athletic director this year. Uh, because he has done a, a tremendous job of, of scheduling things. Um, and, and in the fall, 
when you're working with that color map and you've got a football team that's got to travel and you've got a volleyball team that's got to play in a sectional and you know you got soccer teams you're trying to figure out cross country and and all these different balls in the air um you know i i kind of looked at him and i said listen that's that's your thing that's your baby you know figure it out and and some of these pictures that you see here you know especially with the kids signing for sports that is a direct result of of dan comer trying to make things normal for kids and we got through an entire fall sports season um, even with that map being as crazy as it was um, with, with all of our teams being able to play the vast majority of their games, um, you know, and, and there were, there was a Saturday night um, when we flipped to gold on the map and we had to find someone to play. Um, you know, I was sitting in the parking lot of a Panera talking to Dan on the phone, trying to figure out a way to, to schedule a game with, I think it was Ripley and, and we were working back channels and, and calling people and, you know, he's just been instrumental. Um, and, 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 you know, Dan's the one that's been there from day one. And, and, you know, I think the four of us who are there kind of look at Dan and, and, you know, whenever we're in tough times and, and, you know, he's, he's always got such good perspective and I, and I do, I really got to give him a, a tip of the cap because if, if somebody bleeds spring mills um, it's Dan Comer, man. And, and, and these pictures you see, you know, th this is just our way of, of putting kids out there. Um, there's a picture of, of Nina Saluja and I, she's our national merit scholar this year. Um, second one in a row. Um, you know, we were to take that picture the first day of school, super proud of Nina. Um, there's Luke samples, of some of our, our basketball players from last year. And you got Tyler Gilpin, uh, who signed to play baseball at Fairmont state and Leah Harper, who, who signed to play volleyball at Georgia tech, you know, just anything we can do to give these kids a sense of normalcy. But, but Dan was a huge part of that. And I, I really do just want to thank him for that. And then the last thing is really, we just want to say thank you. And I think I speak on behalf of all the principals in the, in the spring Mills region, you know, our, our, our staff, students, parents, community, I mean, th this has been, and, and, and honestly, for the board members and the senior staff, I know you guys feel this way because it's been that way for you too, but this has been the, t the toughest thing that we've ever done. But we're almost there and, and we're doing this and it's not perfect and it's not been easy. And I'll be honest with you, there's been some days where it's not even been good, um, but we're going to make it through. And, and the reason why we're going to make it through is because uh, up there on campus drive, you know, we just walk in and get it done every day. And I, I just really appreciate the support of our community. I, I appreciate the support of the board, Dr. Murphy, Mr. Dellinger, um, the work you guys are doing. And, and I just want to thank you for, for letting us present tonight. Uh, and that'll kind of wrap things up for us. Okay, at okay, this time, uh, would anyone, anyone in the board have any questions, uh, comments? School, but they are given primary. For those of us online, we we can't understand what's being said. It's all broken up. Again, Mr. Murphy. Okay. This is uh, the question was to Dr. Ponton. I noticed that the STAR test, and I've already received an indication from Dr. Murphy that the STAR test is given from the primary through the uh, middle school. 
Did you hear that? I, I can hear a little bit. There's some some kickback going on. It's very hard to understand. Okay, well. <laughs> Okay, I'll take the mask off, that may help. I, I've already received the answer, but my question was, the STAR test is given uh, to the schools primary through the middle school. Uh, did you hear that, Dr. Ponton? Yes. Okay. Uh, what I found uh, in watching the uh, different presentations is how the scores are high in the 80s in the primary and they go down to about the 40s. Uh, my question is for the primary, the second question is for the primary schools. Uh, I don't remember the four categories, but the bottom two seem to be the ones where they're having trouble. Have do you have any correlation between those students who went to pre-K and kindergarten, which is optional, and those scores in your school of the students um, who are performing at mastery or above, and those students who are unable to, to reach a plateau? Uh, I think there are three primary schools in this configuration. Any, any, just one person? Have you ever looked at the, uh, the background of the children as far as where they attended pre-kindergarten pre and kindergarten? Mr. Murphy, that's a great question and I do not, um, I don't know if I've ever um, seen uh, any kind of correlation between those th who attend pre-K and their star scores. So um, at the middle okay. school level, no. My question is directed to the primary uh, principles. I think I can answer that, um, Pat Murphy. Um, this is Nicole at Spring Mills Primary. Um, we have not really gone through to really like, the only information that we get is when they come to kindergarten registration. And I do believe we've gotten rid of that survey that they would take whether or not they came to pre-K pre or not had pre-K. So we can't really track that because it's not like, when they're in second grade and they take the STAR assessment, because kindergarten does not, it doesn't start until first grade. We don't have evidence of who was in pre-K and who wasn't um, because we don't really have records of that. They do take a quick survey when they come through kindergarten registration and we send that um, to Bev Hoffmaster at the board office. But we do not have anywhere that says as a first grader, whether or not that student was in pre-K or not. I hope that um, helps you understand a little bit better. Thank you. Um, my next question is, um, the, I've got a bunch of them here, but I have to go through, but the um, countywide, and this is, this is more towards Dr. Murphy and the uh, senior staff. We as board members in 23-22 have to be monitoring the academic progress of our students, or supposed to be. And each, each uh, month uh, we receive from uh, Mr. Uh, oh, I'm having a brain freeze here. Uh, the treasurer, Mr. Butts, gives us an update on a financial update. I was wondering, because we are giving these quarterly uh, STAR tests, if the board shouldn't be receiving a the results of these STAR tests uh, for academic accountability and just monitoring what's going on. Uh, I found it interesting to be watching tonight's report and I've noticed the other schools doing it as well. It's kind of quick and you have to write, you have to write rapidly, but uh, we're, we're, we have data here that I think the board should be, be receiving uh, on a quarterly report and uh, be be uh, watching. Uh, would you? Would, would, I mean, I don't. I know you can't say yay or nay now, but uh, do you understand? Do you understand my question, sir? Uh, I believe yes. Um, I would defer to the board as a whole. Um, you know, uh, 
keeping in mind um, your responsibility to the academic program, mm -hmm. but also your uh, fiscal responsibility and in guiding policy. Um, I always ask people when they ask for data, then when you get it, what are you going to do with it? Well, it's the same as I do with the Treasury's report. They can make sure that I'm not alarmed at anything right. and uh, bring a question up at the appropriate time. Right. And that's the spirit and the intent of this evening's meeting and why we've had these LSIC meetings, which um, really is something uh, above and beyond what we are responsible for doing. So I, I feel as a superintendent that it was important for us to get these on the docket and uh, have folks share what they're doing. And there's a lot of wonderful things that are going on in our schools. Right. The, uh, I, I just believe that we should, as a board, be monitoring our community's academic progress. Uh, and this looks like one vehicle through the middle schools. Uh, the Potomac, I know uh, Dr. Alfonso, you've worked at, uh, I believe, Orchard View, and also uh, you're now at Potomac. Uh, we are venturing into large, larger schools, 800, like you have 850 students. I know Orchard View is adding a wing and will have the capability of having a large school. Uh, and I also noticed that you tried to address in your report the mobility rate, which your school had a uh, 37% mobility rate last year, the highest in the county. Are we pushing the bounds of size and management? Um, are, we, are we getting, creating schools which are too large? for elementary, the elementary ages. Just, just an opinion, and maybe if you'd defer not to answer that, I would respect that as well. Thank you for the question. I can only speak to my experience here. Um, this school year is certainly different from years past, and you saw on the presentation that we have brick and click students. So although we do have 797 students in the building, uh, we don't see all of them. And that hasn't been my experience this year. However, I did um, serve on the CFP committee. And I do recall having conversations of um, us being maxed to capacity and us the need for uh, another building to address the prop population on the North region. Um, so that has been a conversation that I've been a part of, but it hasn't been my experience this school year because of the brick and click environment. Okay, that's, that's a reasonable response. I appreciate it. Um, I've gone through each of your schools, um, academic excellence comment. And in each of those schools, you said you're going to either be at or above grade level or demonstrate one year's growth as measured through a variety of assessments. I've served on another committee uh, at the state level and I was reading the code. And here's my question. If I ask you if you want beans and franks for lunch, you would expect two things. If I said you want beans or franks, you would be one or the other. And as I read through, and I've asked the State Department this question, uh, and I'm, I don't expect an answer tonight, but as I, as I read, as, as I'm looking at the code, it says the assessment of students' school and school system performance and progress based on this. And then it goes down to 18.2E5. It talks about performance and progress, performance and progress, performance and progress, down to that section of code. And I'm seeing not just in Berkeley County, we are as, are we substituting the word or, and are we changing the meaning of the law? And I'm going to ask this question, not of you all tonight, but of our uh, legislators when we have a meeting with them because I'm just wondering if this and or or is, is following the code and I'm concerned about that. 
thank you all for your attention. I found it interesting. Um, um, I really enjoyed seeing the star results as you all um, took the time to explain it. And um, I, I do think that as a school board member, one of them, I think we should be watching these star tests. You're giving four of them a year, I, I, I'm assuming. And I think that we should watch those four results, school with school. Thank you. Dr. Queen, a, a question and a comment. Uh, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Beck. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your test scores. I certainly uh, understand uh, the competitive spirit and everything we do. And it's nice to be able to, be able to say uh, we're number one in the county and we beat the state number and we beat the national number. Uh, as I was listening to the presentations and heard the word collaboration come up a number of times tonight, I'm just wondering, do the four high schools get together and have meetings or collaborate and discuss your successes? For example, the, uh, I wrote it down, IXL mathematics, or does the competitive spirit overtake that and you, uh, and you, you want to beat them so you're not going to tell them your secrets? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Beckwith. That, that's a good question. And um, it, it's a friendly rivalry, I would say, the best way to put it. You know, all, all uh, four of the high school principals, we, we, we meet, we have a group text that w the, the four of us are in um, that we text literally, I would say, daily, even on weekends. Um, we, we met today. Uh, as a group over Zoom, and then the the four curriculum APs at the high school level, they have a group text and they meet as well. So, and this is one of those things where you know we all want to be the best. We all we do. We want to put it up there and say, "Hey, we're number one," because it makes you feel good and all that. But the reality is, um, you know, when 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 we can put up there and see that the Berkeley County High Schools did as well as they did on the whole, um, that's a win for the entire community. Um, from our standpoint at Spring Mills, we kind of look at it as, you know, our kids are, are competing against kids from Martinsburg and Musselman and Hedgesville for, you know, those, that precious scholarship money for jobs for things like that. Um, you know, and, and the kids like to see that they're number one. Um, but, but we are all for very open to, if it works there, you know, what, what are you doing for this? What, how are you getting kids to do this? Um, you know, just today, you know, we met, um, you know, to, to kind of talk about if slash when kids come back, you know, what's the best way to do that? Um, so we, we do share ideas and I think it's important to do that. And, and I said this even before I got the job at Spring Mills, you know, there, there were great things going on at the other three high schools whenever I was a curriculum AP at Musselman. Um, and, and one of the, one of the years I grew the most is whenever I, I started to collaborate with the, with Miranda and Carrie and Angie. So it, it's important for us to have that good relationship because none of us have all the answers. You know, and, and the highest uh, or imitation is the highest form of flattery anyway. So we just take it from somebody else and, and call it our own. Thank you very much. That's what I hoped and expected to hear. And again, again, congratulations. The scores look uh, very satisfying. Thank you. Anyone else? Do we have a 95% plus graduation rate here at the high school. But do we know what the average level of performance those graduates are walking out performing? Uh, are they on the 12th grade level, 11th grade level? I mean, the overall average, and I know there are certain students that you would have to not count in that average, but the general graduate, do we as in this county or in this state ask the question, what level are they performing on when they graduate? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's another great question, um, Mr. Murphy. And I, and I think you have, to, you have to pull it apart a little bit because um, as far as proficiency goes, because you can't, you can't slot every kid into the same box, so to speak, because we have kids that are college bound. Uh, we have kids that are workforce bound. We have kids that go into the military. Um, so, so as far as what, what level they're on for proficiency goes, I, I think you've got to break it down and look at what their specialty is. And 
because we have programs at James Rumsey, because we have our own um, CTE programs at the high school level, because we have dual enrollment through Shepherd and Blue Ridge, because, you know, we, we've got ROTC even that prepares kids for, for, you know, branches of the military. Um, I think in general, if there was a way to, you know, put a number on that and say, Hey, you've got to meet such and such score to be considered proficient in your level of, you know, your, your area of expertise, so to speak, I think we'd be satisfied with the results. I really do. And, and I believe the kids that we are, that we are getting across the stage um, are, are, are ready to um, be successful. But, but the biggest thing is there's just multiple paths to success for these kids. And, you know, there's, there's no one right answer. Um, the kid that's going to go be a welder um, might be better at, at, at those types of things than the kid that's going to go to a four-year college. Um, and, and I really think you just have to look at the individual kid uh, and try to tailor their educational experience to that, which is, which is really what we're trying to do at Spring Mills. Okay, if there's nothing else, uh, I would just like to say thank you to all of you presenters tonight, uh, not just the ones that are here, but also to the other principals, assistant principals, uh, uh, teachers, staff, uh, bus drivers, cooks, um, aides, all through the, the gamut of, of folks who work in the school system. This has been the most trying year, the most difficult year that I can remember in uh, my 25 years of being on this board. Um, I think that you all have done such an amazing job uh, under the circumstances to educate our children the best that you possibly could. Um, and, and I just want to say that I appreciate all of you. I know you're working harder than you've ever worked before to make this work. Uh, it's such a difficult time. Um, and I just want to say again, thank you. Um, I hope we're back in school soon um, because our kids need to be there. Um, and, um, and you all have, have shown tonight how dedicated, how diligent you are, and how, um, how you care about the school system and the children in the school system. And I want to thank all of you for doing what you do. Uh, you're to be commended in this difficult time. So thank you very much. And we appreciate the presentation tonight. You've just been amazing. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, we're going to take uh, about a 10 minute break. It's about two minutes till seven now. If we get back here by 7.15, um, that would be good. So um, if we just take a short recess, that would be great. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, um, if there's anyone that's joined us since uh, we started the meeting, we welcome you here tonight uh, for the rest of our meeting. And we're going to start off with our recognitions. Um, and this first one is the student recognitions, and it's the Multicultural Educators Association, the MCA logo contest winner. And Dr. Walker is here to introduce the, those folks that uh, are the winners for that. So Dr. Walker. Good evening and thank you. Today we have three separate recognitions that we're doing. The first one is the Multicultural Education Association logo contest. Shayla Brown will be presenting the winter for, winner for that contest. After that presentation, we'll have a, pre, a brief video of students who took the initiative to express their uh, desires to talk about Dr. Martin Luther King's dream and from their perspective. 
And then lastly, we're going to recognize two students from our district who won and placed in a statewide uh, essay contest uh, regarding race and racism. And so at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Shayla Brown, who is a teacher at Musselman Middle School. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, good evening. Thank you for allowing me this time to present our winner for our logo contest. My name is Shayla Brown and I'm the choir teacher at Musselman Middle School. I'm also co-chair person of the Berkeley County Multicultural Educators Association. This is a group that was formed this past summer to provide a support group for teachers that come from many diverse backgrounds. We wanted a logo that best represented our group and decided to create a contest for students that are a part of Berkeley County Schools. We received over 30 entries, which were narrowed down by teachers in the, in the surrounding schools, and then the co-chair people narrowed it down to one person. I would like to present our winner to the board tonight. I present our MCEA, MCEA logo contest winner. She's a seventh grade student from Mountain Ridge Middle School. Congratulations to Sophie Carpenter. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. And thank you, Sophie, for being here today. And one of the things Sophie um, did win as a part of the contest was she did win an Oculus, um, Oculus Google or binoculars where you can see virtual reality. I'm gonna take a moment to show you what her uh, logo looked like so that you will know and be able to see um, what she created for the Multicultural Education Association. This is a picture of her logo that she created and that was chosen. So again, thank you, Sophie, for uh, your hard work. The next thing that we're going to do, uh, share with you this evening is a recognition that stemmed from the Multicultural Education Meeting that happened in November, late November, early December, of 2020. The discussion was surrounding different things that could be done to recognize um, the special months that happened throughout the school year and specifically specific days. One of the members of the Multicultural Education Association highlighted that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day was coming and that they wanted to see something special done for that day. Another member of the association mentioned, why don't we have students talk about from their perspective, their dream for equality as it pertains to Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. So out of that particular initiative, we had two student volunteers who are a part of the equity and inclusion senior staff advisory team put together a video and shared their thoughts about their dream as far as equality is concerned. This is about a two and a half minute video that I'm going to share with you right now. of change and see the words that are associated with America like liberty, justice, and freedom be true for all people. Relationship preference would hinder us from our aspirations. 
I have a dream that learning about LGBTQ plus isn't a talk of uncurved ability in our schools. I have a dream that the ignorant choose facts and education as their way of defense rather than violence. I have a dream that Blacks and people of color can feel and know that they are just as equal as to anyone else. I have a dream that HBCUs are advertised like a new pair of tennis shoes. I have a dream that in schools around the world, we can form one another. We can inform one another of our successes, backgrounds without being judged. I have a dream that I can go to sleep at night knowing that I am indeed gaining the same opportunities as others. I have a dream that black lives won't be undermined nor discarded like an unwanted gum wrapper. I have a dream that I made it this far because of my drive, determination, and consistency, and not because someone felt forced to include me as a prop because of the color of my skin. So we thank those two students who were brave and courageous enough to share their dream with us today regarding uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's dream of equality. The last student recognition that we have this evening would be two students who placed in a statewide anti-racist contest, writing contest. I'm going to give you some information about the contest, the 2021 statewide Martin Luther King Project on Racism honors the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. While encouraging students' creativity, this annual contest was open to any student in grades one through 12 attending public, private, parochial, or homeschool in the state of West Virginia, yeah. or any student under uh -huh. the age of 20 enrolled in a high school uh, correspondence or task program in the state of West Virginia. The contest included essays, five minute short films and music. The 2021 Project on Racism contest was based on the following quote from Dr. King. We may have all come on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. The essay winners for Berkeley County Schools who placed, which was a high honor, there were two students. One of them was uh, placed second place in the nine through 12 uh, range and her name is Elena Fry. And she has a parent that works at uh, Hedgesville Elementary School. And the second place read winner for grades K through five was Reed Boswell. And he has parents that work at Spring Mills Primary and North Middle School. I'm gonna take a moment to play read, reading his essay, which is approximately two minutes. If you give me just a moment to uh, get the video. Just a moment. And then we'll allow them an opportunity to say hello to everyone. One moment, please. I can see that I am the same as others around me. I can see with my eyes that my skin color is different than others, but it doesn't matter. I don't mind being a little different. I think it would be boring if everyone looked alike or had the same personality. I like my friends because they are fun and different than me. This is how we are different. We have different skin. We don't all have the same shelter. We wear different clothes. And my one friend can speak Spanish. Being different is awesome. Different does not mean bad or wrong. It means good. Different is good because we would all write and speak the same language. I also would not see all the different people around me. The world is a colorful, wonderful earth. 
So we thank Elena and we thank Reed for this outstanding accomplishment. I'm going to see Elena, did you wanna say hello to um, everyone that's um, here with us today? I'll give you an opportunity if you would like to. Hi. <laughs> and that is Elena. She is the second place winner um, for the state and she is um, a student at Hedgesville High School. Hi, Reed. Would you like to say hello to everyone? Hello. And Reed is the second place winner for the state, ages K through five. Let's please give them a round of applause for their hard work. Thank you, Dr. Queen. And I will turn this back over to you. Hey, Elena and Reed. Uh, congratulations to both of you all. Uh, I know both of you well, and uh, I'm so proud of you all for doing such a wonderful job with this project. Uh, it, it's amazing what our young students can do and come up with. Uh, I'm so proud of you all. Thank you so much. Okay, item number two on the agenda is the Distinguished Service Award. <laughs> Becky, are you there? I'm here. Okay. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm honored. Um, I'm here tonight to recognize my head cook, Nancy Parsons, for the Distinguished Service Personnel Award of the Month. Um, she, we presented her her plaque today in school. Um, but she is on here watching and I'm really proud to be here to represent, to recognize her. She, along with two of my other cooks, Mrs. Davis and Mrs. Catra will be retiring at the end of this school year. Um, Mrs. Parsons and I have worked together for nine years. Today is, is my 10th year anniversary at North Middle School. And she's been with me for the majority of the time. This past year has truly been a challenge for the food service industry, but Mrs. Parsons leadership um, and our cooks did not miss a beat. They showed flexibility with the ever-changing schedule and they jumped in to help neighboring schools when needed. Mrs. Parsons has attended national and state conferences as our head cook, and she was elected by her peers to hold a state office, the West Virginia School Nutrition Association Regional Chair. Nancy has included innovative ideas in our cafeteria, including the fruit and vegetable kiosk, um, and tasting days for students. She attends our weekly admin meetings to stay aware of what's going on in our building and to inform us of needs. She truly cares about her girls in the kitchen. She looks out for them to make sure that they are abreast of upcoming school events and important emails. She also sets high expectations for a well-run kitchen. I have had zero incidents of kitchen staff not working harmoniously. The girls work so well together under her leadership. I chose the following adjectives to describe Mrs. Parsons. Loyal, hardworking, dedicated, caring, problem solver, self-motivated, driven, nurturing, generous, and humble. Tracy Heck says this about Mrs. Parsons. If there was ever a BCS child nutrition hero poster, it would have Nancy Parsons' picture on it. 
Mrs. Parsons has been an advocate locally and nationally for her students and peers. I wish we could clone her. In preparing for this presentation, I asked her fellow cooks to give me one or two sentences about Mrs. Parsons. Here's what they said. We have worked with Nancy several years. Through those years, she's been kind-hearted, flexible with our personal needs, and always giving a helping hand with our certifications. Nancy has a genuine concern for the students' nutritional needs. She's very easygoing and open to our suggestions and ideas. They wanted to thank her for her years of hard work and dedication to our kitchen, and they hope that she will enjoy her retirement, and they also wanted to congratulate her tonight on her award. Mrs. Parsons wears many hats. She's very close to her family, her husband Gary and she will enjoy retirement at the end of the school year with some much needed vacation time. We hope that this reward shows a smidge of appreciation that is felt for her on a daily basis. We couldn't think of a more deserving recipient than Mrs. Nancy Parsons. Thank you, Ms. Eiler. I appreciate the kind words. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, I try to treat people the way I want to be treated. And I think that goes a long way with my girls. Um, I love the kids. Um, it's, it's been a good 16 years. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, and congratulations on this award for being so special uh, to the kids and to your folks that work in the kitchen with you. Um, you mean so much to the everyday process of the school. It, uh, it's just, um, we can't explain to you how important it is. And I know you're such a humble person and, uh, and you don't like to be in the limelight, but you've done such a wonderful job and we really do appreciate it so much. Thank you and, and thank you for 16 years and we hope your retirement is wonderful. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Item number three on the agenda is the Volunteer of the Month Award and uh, principal at Martinsburg High School, Trent Sherman is gonna come uh, forward and present that recipient. Trent, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Dr. Murphy, uh, Dr. Queen, board members. Uh, appreciate you having us here tonight. Uh, the gentleman that I'm gonna to talk to you about for Volunteer of the Month is no stranger to Berkeley County Schools. He worked at Musselman High School for 37 years and before we uh, enticed him into coming over to the dark side here at Martinsburg. Um, he's done just about everything for us here at Martinsburg. He's been an ISS teacher. Uh, he's been our, a security guard. He's been an assistant principal a couple of times. Um, he he helps out in our hallways. In past years, uh, he's volunteered in our lunchroom to make sure students are going uh, where they need to be going. He pretty much does anything we ask of him. Um, he just enjoys being around our students and being around our staff. Um, and it's a blessing to me uh, to have someone here in the building who has uh, as many years of experience in administration and education as he does. Because when I have issues and things maybe that I haven't run across, I've got that knowledge base to, to rely on. And many times I'll just bring him into my office and say, hey, Charlie, what would you do in this situation? And get some advice from him. So our volunteer of the month uh, this month is uh, Charlie Klein. So I'm gonna let him say a few things. Dr. Queen, the board, I'd like to thank you all for letting me be part of this tonight. I'd like to thank Mr. Sherman and his staff, especially Mr. Morris and, and uh, Mr. Sign that uh, made, made this possible. Uh, just to take you back, and a lot of people sitting there don't know this. Uh, I know that uh, they're gonna think, but I interviewed in 1968 with Dr. Mudge for a job. And we interviewed for about an hour, and I don't remember much about it. I had to bar a vest to wear so that I looked professional. When we got through the interview, Dr. Mudge said, you will have a job here in Berkeley County. Right now, I don't know where. And uh, it finally came down to Mr. Waldeck and Musselman had a uh, 
conference with me, gave me a job as a health and PE teacher and coach. So in 1968, kind of started my adventure into Berkeley County. I have to be honest with you, I have enjoyed every day. I still enjoy getting up. I like working around kids. I like working with people. I like working in, in athletics. At Mussman, uh, I did athletics and attendance. Some of the people that are part of Berkeley County now, uh, Mr. Banks, uh, uh, Mr. Butts, the finance director, they both were sports stars, uh, Mr. Banks at Berkeley and Mr. Bur uh, Butts at M Musselman. And uh, Mr. Dillinger there, he and I attended many meetings together uh, as going to an athletic conference. Uh, we traveled a lot of miles. Uh, I'm not sure that we ever agreed on much. <laughs> he, he was Hedgesville and I was Musselman and that was kind of a, uh, water and oil deal. And uh, I one year won athletic director of the year, but I made a statement in the paper that uh, Mr. Dillinger, as far as I was concerned, was the best athletic director in the whole state. One other thing besides being honored to have this, when uh, he showed it to me, I said, is it not ironic that this award has an apple on it? I, I, I said, so that just makes it the best of both, being an apple and being a bulldog. I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank especially Mr. Sherman for allowing me to come into his school. I'd like to thank the ladies out of James Rumsey, the, the principals out there when I was there for four years. And Berkeley County is just, has always been my educational home. And from the deepest part of my heart, I want to thank, thank you and uh, just keep coming back. Thank you. Hey, Charlie, this is Bill Queen. Is it on? Hello, sir. Hey, I just wanna thank you for 37 great years of service to Berkeley County Schools and uh, I've admired you for your work you've done in the south end of the county uh, for so many years and uh, so surprised you came in to be a bulldog, uh, but I watched you operate there. I saw you not too long ago and you were so focused on doing what you were doing. Um, this, this county is such uh, beholding to you, sir, for what you've done and, uh, and you've served as an example of a great educator and uh, this, this award is uh, well-deserved by you, sir, and we want to thank you and we appreciate uh, all you've done uh, for this school system and all the kids. You've seen many kids go through the system and uh, you've mentored them, you've helped them and uh, made a difference in those kids' lives. And that's why you're being recognized tonight because you have definitely made a difference. And thank you, Charlie. We appreciate it, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Queen. And... Uh, I look forward to uh, some years to come. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I, th I think you still got some fuel in your tank. You're gonna be okay, sir. Okay, we're gonna move on to item number six, which is the citizens forum. And before we start that, I'm gonna have to read the rules for a citizens forum. Uh, citizens forum is a time for the public desiring to address the board on any topic at a regular meeting. To keep the time for the citizens forum to a reasonable level, the board president will determine an allotted amount of time for each speaker in order to allow the board to conduct its regularly scheduled business. The board shall not consider, discuss, or take action on items addressed during citizens forum that does not appear on tonight's meeting agenda. Due to the current guidelines and best practices recommended by federal and state health officials, we are conducting citizens forum in person and virtually. The board has accepted email comments and those comments have been shared with the board members and will not be read aloud nor shared publicly unless the citizen joins the meeting to read his or her statement online. As the board president, I have determined that speakers will have the opportunity to share comments for three minutes tonight. Derogatory comments, profanity, inappropriate comments and or referencing an employee or student by name will result in a muted microphone and removal from the active Zoom meeting. Citizens who have requested to speak via Zoom have been given access to join the meeting. 
Speakers have joined the meeting via a waiting room will remain there until announced. When announced, the speaker will be given audio access to the meeting. Once a speaker has completed addressing the board, school board or the speaker's time has expired, the speaker will be removed from the Zoom meeting and may continue viewing the meeting through website streaming. So with that being said, uh, the first person that signed up to speak is Rashada Yost. And I think Rashada is here. Hi, um, hello. Um, just would like to find out if you can just give me a little bit of the time. I know it's three minutes. I did not want to read my notes. I would like to be heard, please. My name is Rashida Yost, and I am the owner and director of the Yost Child Development Center in Professional Court and Yost Child Development Center Tavern. Firstly, I would like to present the reality show where in the community where my daycare is, Dad works and pay bills and mom stays home and assists children with the virtual learning is La La language. Most if not all mom are either single parents or couples with two or more children. They work nine to five, six to six, seven to seven. So the kids attend my daycare. More than 50% of the parents with children attend my daycare work at the hospital. They do not have the luxury to work from home or see patients via CSO or Zoom meetings. They just don't have that. I receive a lot of calls and texts from the parents crying, break down, they don't know what to do. Thank goodness, Yost Child Development Center and the staff of my daycare, 13 full-time awesome uh, staff of uh, teachers, cooks, cleaner, and caregivers take this honor help to help 24 school age kids throughout the virtual learning. Challenges we face, kids come with iPad not charged. Even if they are, the charge are out by noon. And then there are about four outlets in each room. Thus, the Zoom meeting afternoon and assignments are at risk. Teachers change Zoom meeting last minute and parents fail to update teachers. Teachers fail or at some point even refuse to let students back in because of previous incidents where children refuse to focus and or use the bathroom during Zoom meeting. Most assignments have cut off time and parents who pick up the children after four simply cannot help their kids. Most, most due to parents' hectic schedule, students fail to bring their texts and practice books to the daycare to complete their assignments. I have students from pre-K to seventh grade attending the daycare, almost seven different schools, total of 74 kids with other age group from uh, babies to, uh, to two, three, four, five years old. I also have five high risk group of students whom I personally coach every weekend myself from eight to six, 8 a.m. in the morning, 6 p.m., Saturdays and Sundays, tutoring them with phonics, reading, and science. I also have an eight-year-old son who was in honor roll in uh, Bunker Hill Elementary. And kindergarten, first grade, and Tuscarora Elementary in second grade. He's doing third grade now virtual. Now the boy is doing fourth grade assignments, but he's failing. Why? Because I put 23 other kids in front of my son. I'm requesting the board to agree to his parents to have homeschool so that we can teach them and not have time wasted on virtual learning. They cannot concentrate. Seven different schools, so many great level. It's very, very tough. And then if they can offer homeschool, which I'm going to have a meeting with my parents tomorrow at my daycare at 545, 2007 professional court, I will have them decide whether they want to get homeschool or not. And of course, my request is to ask for help if any one of you or the teachers can come to my daycare and give us syllabus, materials, or anything that we can do. Today, I fill up a bank loan. I don't need it, but I have to because I need, I need some cash so I can, I can enroll more teachers for my new tablet, which should be open by March with licensing approval and everything so that I can accommodate more virtual learners because I don't know when y'all gonna open. Kids need to learn. I have the staff, I signed a five-year lease for the second premise and I hope that would work. I need all the help I can get, not just money, but syllabus materials and, and please help me. Thank you. Ms. Chanel Messner did not sign in, okay. Uh, Josh Berry is the next person on the list. Josh. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. 
Uh, my name is Josh Berry. I have uh, three kids in the Berkeley County School System, um, one at Musselman Middle and then two at Musselman High. Uh, back in the summer, myself, as well as all Berkeley County families, were given the option for uh, brick or click. I chose brick for my children because this was what best for them as well as what, it, what they wanted. My children wanted to be in school. My children have received a great ed education through uh, the Berkeley County School System. To this point, as they've had some of the best teachers and administrators. However, that is no longer the case. Virtual school is failing my children. They are no longer receiving the education they're entitled to. And this is no fault of the teachers, but to the decisions of the state, now the local level. I no longer have a choice for, for my BRIC students. Families that chose CLIC aren't affected by your decision last week. Only families that chose BRIC. Um, teachers are essential. Again, with, with, as with any uh, essential worker, there are risks with performing their duties. Based on the data from the CDC, as well as the State Board of Education, everyone is recommending that kids need to be in school. Schools have put in protocols that have been very effective. My understanding is almost all cases involving teachers have come from the community and not from schools. Kids need to be in school five days a week, not, not anything less than five. If the, if the board is going to go against the state recommendation, it really needs to go again the, against the recommendation to keep high school kids out of school. High school kids are, are falling behind in preparation for colleges, competing with students from other states who have not been hampered by this uh, virtual education. The mental aspects and the lack of social interaction through isolation takes a toll even on the most resilient kid. And that, and that far outweighs the risk of exposure to COVID-19. Again, I, I just think that uh, kids need to be in school. I think I've emailed each one of you several times of talking to some of you as well. I think that uh, you need to go revisit your decision and get, get our kids back into school for the brick parents. If the click kids want to stay at click, let them stay click. Thank you. The next person signed up to speak is Brian Horner. Brian Horner. Brian, can you hear me? Mr. Horner, can you hear me? What's that, Dave? Okay. She did. Okay, the next person then is Chanel Messner. Chanel, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, I can hear. Go ahead. Okay, um, so I just wanna begin by saying that coming into the meeting, I, I already feel defeated and discouraged. Um, one of the main reasons is because I also emailed and an email was sent by me um, to remain unnamed, but it was an email that was also sent to several other people. Um, that's ingenuine to me. I don't feel like that addresses our concerns as parents. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and read some of my email so that everyone can hear it. Um, I hope this email finds you well. I'm reaching out in reference to my children. I have four children in Berkeley County School System eighth grade, sixth grade, fifth grade, and kindergarten. Myself, along with other parents, have elected brick learning when given the option at the beginning of school. This was a choice that we made for our children when contemplating the personal needs and growth that each learning environment has to offer. Brick allows children structure, normalcy, and social interactions. Challenges we have faced related to virtual are failing grades, which our children have always been straight A students. This won't count 
because we're not in school and it's a pan pandemic. That's their mental outlook on this. Decisions as to whether you go to work or you have to take off and risk your job to stay home with your child. As a business owner, not attending necessary meetings to get payment for services, not being able to complete the services, hours of school work, after we work 10, 12 hour days, missing dinner or as a family to complete schoolwork, no home normalcy for working parents or students, lack of social development, severe lack of confidence, mental health issues, being exposed to more people and exposing more people, my parents especially who are both diabetics because they have to bounce around for care. Um, the list goes on and on and this is just in one household. I understand, I sympathize with every single individual that has a position to make a decision that you're faced with. And I know that you're all faced with several differing opinions from all types of people. Although opinions do differ, I feel I can speak for many saying that had we known that this was a route that was gonna be paid for our students, we would have sought out other options. We aren't doing temperature checks. We have a neighboring state that has a school district that's been utilizing a hybrid model, allowing the students the opportunity to attend. And they've been attending with zero interruptions since opening. Specifically in our family, each of our children are participating in soccer, football, karate, dance, basketball, baseball within our states and in other states. Which brings me to the next topic. Our children are the least susceptible population. So how long are we going to deprive them of a normal education? But these events can take place. We have the right to attend church, go to restaurants, take a flight on a fully booked aircraft and go to a bar or club, but we can't give our children a fair chance at such an impressionable time or exercise a decision that we chose at the beginning of school. I'm a Berkeley County citizen. I grew up in the Berkeley County school system. I'm a parent volunteer, a business owner that supports the school. And I'm just asking that we can give our children a fair opportunity. Okay, the next person signed up to speak is Christina Combs. She did not sign up. Okay. What's that? Brian Horner. Mr. Horner, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, sir, we can. Okay, sorry about that. I was having cell phone difficulties here. Um, my name is Brian Horner. Um, I'm a lifelong resident, South Berkeley County, born and raised. Um, I got two boys. Uh, one just graduated from Mossman High School last year, and I have a junior in Mossman High School this year. Um, like like we've, we've heard before, and you know, but it's it's the point that needs to be made. Uh, we all had a we all had a choice um, when school started back in August, September, whether we wanted brick or click. I think roughly 60% of 60% of Muslim kids choose brick um, for in-person learning. And we, we choose that so he could be with his teachers who went to school to be a teacher and for, to socially be with his classmates. Um, my oldest, my oldest son, like I said, graduated last year. He missed his prep rallies. He missed his homecomings, his prom, his sporting, his sports season. And he experienced a drive through graduation, which some say that, that's, that's fine and that worked out great, but that's, that's not normal for these kids. And our, our junior and senior class are, that, that now, they're missing out on many opportunities to study, of course, and prepare for the ACT and SAT testings. I mean, they, they've, they've rescheduled them, they've rescheduled them. Uh, the take rate on it is plummeted because of, you know, the, the kids aren't in the schools. They don't have the teachers pushing them to sign up, to take the tests. And also, many of these kids are student athletes, like my son, who are missing out on potential scholarships or financial aid. Uh, it doesn't mean they're going to go to the NBA or the NFL, but 
there's, you know, division three, division two, there's private schools that, that will offer financial aid for these kids. And, and we know we're well aware that kids in this area, you know, we're average incomes, you know, we don't have the high, the Loudoun County income family incomes so that can afford to send your kid wherever. And some of these kids, it's, it's the only opportunity that they will have is maybe through their sports or their cheerleading or their band. Um, and they're missing out on that compared to other areas. And the virtual learning has become a game in itself. The kids, they, they can wake up, they log in, they get their assignments, they complete by the date, or they're done for the day or for the week. Um, it's just, that's, that's how it has worked out. And then, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, that's the gist of it. Um, me, myself, I've been directly involved with probably over 100 kids in this area, coaching three different sports. And, and some of them, that's all they look forward to is being with their classmates, being socially involved, being with their teammates. You know, the home life for some of these kids is not the greatest. Um, we've always been involved with football, with feeding the kids, you know, before their practices and games. And they, that sometimes is the best meal that they have. Um, these kids, you know, they're at home half the time. They don't have the luck if they got peanut butter and jelly. So the school lunches, yes, I know they're, they're there for, for people to pick up, but how many people actually have, you know, you know, use that or, or, you know, take advantage of that. There's so many that don't and the kids are nutrition wise are suffering. And I guess my point is with, with the kids, with these, with the older ones, the, the schedules that they're doing now with this virtual, is it really preparing them for life? You, I mean, you can log in, do your classwork and, you know, play your Xbox, you know, go to the gym, go to work. I know kids that are working. I mean, is that what we want our 16, 17 year old kids doing? I mean, they got the rest of their lives for that. So I think we need to look around at our neighboring states. Um, there's great, there's great um, guidelines and practices that people are using. But that stuff that happened last week that was pulled over on our board was, I, I couldn't believe it happened. I mean, it's, it was appalling. Mr. Horner, are... your time has expired. I'm going to have to uh, end it right there. Thank you, sir. That completes everyone that signed up to speak at Citizens Forum. Um, we're going to go on to item number seven, which is the uh, minutes of the regular meeting on January the 4th, uh, the minutes of the special meeting on January 13th. We have one student transfer request. We have four budget supplement requests and 26 budget uh, transfer requests. We need to approve the payment of bills and approve the invoices, the financial reports, and the treasurer's report for all for the month ending December 31st, 2021, for 2020. Um, so is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Second. A motion by Mr. Martin, a second by Mr. Beckwa to approve the consent agenda as <clears throat> presented. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> it carries unanimously. Uh, item eight on the agenda is the uh, proposed changes to the board meeting calendar. Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Dr. Queen. We've got a, a couple of uh, changes and adjustments with time that I would like to uh, bring forward to the board this evening uh, as a recommendation and then to uh, have you folks vote on that. Dr. Murphy, uh, would you pull that mic to you a little closer all to right, you? How's that? Good. Right. Uh, is it possible to reflect those changes up on the screen? So here are the changes that I'm recommending. The first is on March 1st, where we recognize our National Board Certified Teachers. 
uh, and to be in that meeting at 6 p.m. Uh, the second is a date and a time change, uh, moving the meeting from April 5th to the 12th. Uh, and then the start time would be 6.30, and this is because of spring break. Uh, the second is, a, or the third is also a date and time change, uh, April 19th to the 26th, and the start time would be 6.30 p.m. Uh, and this is because of the uh, our public hearing, a uh, second public hearing on our calendar, and also deadlines for personnel. We have a scheduled meeting then on the 20th uh, at 7.30 a.m., and this would be a virtual meeting, and it's reconvening the uh, uh, for the statutory levy rates. Um, we have a time change on May the 5th to 5.30 for teacher uh, of the year recognition. Also a time change on the 7th to 5.30 p.m. for our retirement celebration. And then a date change from June 21 to June 22. And this is because of the uh, West Virginia Day celebration holiday on Monday, June the 21st. Do I hear a motion from the board to approve these date and time changes and additional meetings uh, scheduled and as explained by Dr. Murphy? So moved. Second. Motion by Dr. Gilpin, a second by Mr. Beckwith to approve these uh, time and date changes. Uh, is there any discussion? Just, just a question, Dr. Murphy. <clears throat> June the 22nd is the regular school board meeting. Uh, it's seven o'clock. Yes, the, uh, it's just a date change for uh, June 21 to June 22. Okay, thank you. Other discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Item number two on the agenda and action items is the personal action of Dr. Schooley. Good evening, Dr. Queen, members of the board. The personnel actions stated Monday, January the 19th, or Tuesday, excuse me, Tuesday, January 19th, 2021 are as follows. We have one new coaching appointment. We have one correction of a coaching appointment. And with that correction brings the recension of the interim appointment. We have two resignations of coaches, two new extra duty appointments, unpaid leave of absence, two one seventh appointment uh, there five new professional appointments. Uh, and one of those there that is highlighted in yellow is uh, for the administrative assistant board clerk position. Uh, we have one policy 5,000, two resignations of professional employees, five retirements of professional employees, one transfer of professional employees. To begin the service personnel on page three, we have three new appointments of service personnel, three resignations of service personnel, and four retirements. We have three transfers of service personnel from one position to another. Uh, with college hours ending, as uh, aides are able to receive upgrades based on their college hours. So many of these are upgrading, so there are four total upgrades for this board agenda. We have one new substitute nurse appointment and removing one substitute nurse. We have six new service personnel subs. Three of those are bus operators and three are aides. We have nine new appointments of substitute teachers and one resignation of a substitute teacher for a total of 59 personnel actions for Tuesday, January the 21st, 2021 with the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion from the board to approve the professional service coaching and substitute personnel actions uh, dated uh, Tuesday, January 19th, 2021 as presented? I move we approve the professional service substitute and coaching uh, positions as presented. Second. Second. Motion by Mr. Beckwith, a second by Dr. Gilbin to approve all the personnel actions as presented tonight. Uh, Again, dated January 21st, January 19th, 2021. Is there any discussion? 
I have <clears throat> uh, the administrative assistant. Would that be a professional? Or yes, that is a professional position. Uh, will this person be doing the job which Ms. Kisner is yes. doing? Yes. Okay. And I was reading the, the uh, resume, which I appreciated. Very impressive credentials. I'm just wondering, she'll be doing these these duties plus it looks like some more. Yes, correct. Say. It's it's a expand the job description that came with that, yes. But we're not gonna have to hire another person. Not at this time, no. At this time. I mean I mean there's always change in the growing school system. Okay. Other questions? Discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. I have a motion, aye. amendment. Amendment, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, my usual, uh, I move to amend all 261s uh, down to 247 who are being newly hired. Is that it? I have a motion, I have an amendment to the motion by Mr. Murphy to uh, change all 261 employees on the uh, personnel list tonight to 247. Is there a second? Hearing no second, the motion, uh, the amendment to the motion uh, does not pass. Uh, now we'll vote on the uh, original motion, uh, uh, motion to approve all of the uh, personnel actions. So uh, all those in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Any opposed? It carries unanimously. Um, item three under action items is the uh, school building authority uh, needs grant request. Uh, Scott Mathis is here to present that. Scott, floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Queen, board members. I'm here tonight seeking approval to submit the uh, SBA needs grant application you all have copies of um, for the safe and secure entrances for 14 of Berkeley County schools. Um, the scope of this project really involves construction of vestibules, door storefronts, um, and integrating modern technologies, uh, access control, to increase the safety and security of our staff, students, and the public. Um, this, by providing a more secure environment, uh, we can lead to potentially better learning and better teaching by our students and staff. Uh, we are proposing to match the funds, uh, or request 50% of the funds for the project from the state. Uh, total project cost right now is budgeted, or we're submitting budgeted at 5,375,000. Uh, so we are requesting from the SBA Two million six hundred eighty-seven five or eighty-seven thousand five hundred, and uh, we're asking for the local county to commit that as well. Um, but at this point, this submission needs to be to the SBA uh, by January 29th, next Friday. We wanted to get this in front of the board and to have board backing and approval. Is there a motion to motion from the board to approve um, this? School construction funds needs project um, as presented tonight, uh, total of uh, $2,687,500 from the SBA and uh, the same amount from local funds. Total project costs us $5,375,000. So a motion to approve this needs project request to the uh, SBA. Second. Motion by Mr. Martin and a second by Mr. Beckel to approve the needs project as presented tonight. Is there any discussion? Just an inquiry. I've seen Mr. Banks is here. This is not the CEFP, uh, any form of it. This is a separate standalone request. Uh, Mr. Murphy, all these projects that Mr. Math has just mentioned were included in the CEFP. Okay. Um, could I still request that name on that aerial photograph of all those properties that I've been trying to get for ever since we got into the CEFP, just an aside. Um, I'm going to vote for this, but I, uh, I still believe instructionally we're wasting a lot of time with limited restrooms and, uh, I, uh, 
We've been there many times, I, Mr. I Murphy. I, I think we've uh, pretty much put that to sleep at this point. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a problem. So well, when, um, we, when we do a school bond, I'll, I'm sure you all understand where I'm coming from. But, uh, but to this project, it's a safety issue at the front door as I've read it. Am I correct, Mr. Uh, Matthew? Yes. Yes, Mr. Murphy, that is correct. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, item number nine on the agenda is the board announcements. Anyone have anything, any announcements from the board? If not, we'll go to superintendent's announcements, Dr. Murphy. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Queen. I have some very brief announcements this evening. Okay. Why don't I go through these and then we can post them to the website. Um, the first is I, I just want to uh, say thank you and recognize the school board. January is school board appreciation month. And I think our community should be well aware that uh, among the five board members, there's over 75 years of combined experience and as elected officials uh, that speaks well to you and also the service that you have provided this community over a number of years. And not only do we want to thank you, but also thank your families. Uh, they are indirectly involved and um, very supportive of you with the time that you spend uh, doing school board business. So I would just like to recognize you as part of this month's celebration. A couple of save the dates that I want to also bring to your attention. On Tuesday, January the 26th is the end of the, uh, the nine week grading period. We have report cards going out on February the 3rd, and then we've got a series of uh, parent-teacher conferences scheduled, primary February 9th, intermediate February 10th, and middle school February the 11th. Uh, right now, or at this time, we have extracurricular uh, activities and athletics practices starting on February the 14th. Uh, and right now, games are slated to begin on March the 3rd. Uh, many of you have also either been involved or heard about the uh, vaccination process here among school employees. We have approximately over uh, 3,000 employees, including our coaches, uh, substitutes, and temporary employees. Uh, and while uh, we are pushing out the vaccine or making it available to them, uh, on January the 8th, we were able to administer over 468 doses. And then this past Friday, another six doses. So we've been able to provide the opportunity to uh, well over 1,000 of our employees who are interested in receiving the vaccine. Uh, pictured here is uh, Patricia Sewell, who's an aide at Hedgesville High School. Uh, and just thank you to those uh, that are taking advantage of that. We will continue to be rolling vaccine out here uh, in the coming weeks and into the uh, next month. Also, finally, we've got a virtual job fair coming up here on January the 13th and the 21st, uh, and it's for our service staff. Uh, if you are interested in signing up, you can go uh, to here to the uh, URL that we've provided work for bcs.com. It describes the different jobs and functions uh, and how to become an employee. And I actually participated in one of these uh, events recently and it was uh, very productive. They're a small group, a lot of questions can be answered. Uh, and we have a number of people, uh, even though it was a small group, interested in uh, a variety of the jobs that we have out there. So I encourage folks, if you know someone, uh, please pass that along to them. Uh, it's, an, it's an excellent opportunity to kind of begin or start your career and grow. That's all I have this evening uh, right now, Dr. Queen. So I'll turn it back over to you. Sir, thank you. That brings us to item number 11 on the agenda, which is the adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. 
Second. A motion by Mr. Murphy, a second by Dr. Gilpin to adjourn. Is there any discussion? Just that we're going to go into another meeting now in case the audience is wondering. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries unanimously. We are adjourned in uh, just a couple minutes. We'll start with the other meeting. Okay, this is Tuesday, January 19th, 2021, and uh, I'd like to call this emergency meeting of the uh, Board of Education Order. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone that's here uh, in the uh, auditorium at Spring Mills High School and everyone that's there virtually. So, um, <clears throat> is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Murphy, a second by Mr. Beckwith to uh, approve the agenda as presented. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Item number three on the agenda is the reports, discussion, follow-up action, and um, updated return to learn plan. Dr. Murphy. Uh, thank you, Dr. Queen. Um, I'd like to revisit the uh, special or the uh, yeah, special meeting that we had uh, last week on January the 13th. Uh, and at that time, the uh, state board was also convening in regards to um, the status of uh, in-person instruction. Uh, this board took action based on my recommendation uh, to remain in uh, virtual learning uh, until we met certain benchmarks, uh, one being that all employees were provided uh, the opportunity to receive uh, two vaccines uh, for the virus and the other being that we uh, remove ourselves from the red status. In a letter to the state superintendent, I also outlined uh, and the, uh, the uh, Board of Education president, I outlined um, some very specific things regarding our concern about uh, returning to uh, in-person instruction. Uh, the first being our geographic location here uh, in Berkeley County and some of the things that are happening in surrounding the surrounding region uh, with regards to the infection rate and the percent of positivity uh, and how COVID was continuing, the spread of COVID was continuing to rise not only in our community, but in our region. I also noted uh, the positivity rate here has been um, consistently high ranging anywhere from 14 to 17% for 100,000 individuals. Uh, we also are showing uh, almost 800 more cases here in our county than any other uh, county in the state. Uh, and that while we've been fully remote, we have also seen uh, a number of cases among our staff, uh, 10, over 10% 10 testing positive among our service and professional staff and um, we've had to quarantine uh, over 200 individuals. And this is during the time period of uh, November 23rd until we returned after break. Uh, that's approximately uh, 300 individuals. That represents about 10% of our workforce. Uh, and I think that is significant in the sense that we were remote at that time. Uh, and I am concerned with bringing um, staff and students back uh, and the current, you know, 
increase in um, the spread of the virus, uh, what that may do not only to individuals and their health, but also just to our total operation. Well, I just made uh, clear in our announce my announcements that we have administered over 1,000 vaccines. That's just the first dose. We still have over 500 individuals who are still interested in receiving um, the first dose. Uh, and then we still have to go through um, a second round of providing those vaccines to individuals who've already received them. I think we are fortunate also here, as I made mention in my letter, that we do have a strong one-to-one -one initiative. This was established a number of years ago. We were able to begin the year. We also have advances with our internet and accessibility here that are not um, particular in other parts of the state because they are more rural or remote. And so I think one of the characteristics that I've pointed out throughout my letter is that Berkeley, Berkeley County is different than um, some of the other areas and one size does not fit all. Um, I'd like to read um, something um, very specific that we did have conversation with uh, some of our other leaders and that is, we wish to take a more gradual approach to returning to school now that will set Berkeley County up for a strong academic finish at the end of the school year and be able to celebrate some of those milestone moments that our students and families are looking for. So I took and recommended to the board to take a more conservative approach, um, a slow go approach. I know I've called on our families to be patient and have understanding, uh, but I also think um, that um, position uh, set us up um, to be very careful as far as how we uh, move forward. My request though to the state superintendent was denied. And so as a consequence of that, um, I am bringing forward to you uh, a plan uh, this evening that does have our students uh, returning, those students who are in uh, brick. Mr. Kenny, if you could bring up the, uh, the slides now, that would be great. Um, I've just really spoken to this first slide here about my uh, request uh, for a waiver to the Board of Education and the Department of Ed, uh, and they have returned that denied to us. So I, I wanna try and highlight some of the the things we are going to be pushing out, depending on the board's vote this evening, we are going to be pushing out to communicate to our staff and our families. So this is quite a bit of information that folks uh, will um, have to digest. And so I'll, I'll move th through it slowly here. Uh, the first is we're going to continue to provide five days of instruction uh, using our blended models of either uh, brick or click. And essentially for click students, uh, their schedules are not going to change. Um, their you know, operation as they know it and, and their learning is gonna continue and that was a choice that they made. We are also going to carry out uh, the free uh, curbside meal service uh, and that will be provided on Monday. Uh, that will be part of uh, the overall plan. Uh, so uh, meal side services uh, will continue and we're gonna designate as we have in the past, Monday is gonna be that pivotal day. For pre-K through eighth grade BRIC students, um, they will attend at least two days of in-person um, instruction, regardless of the uh, West Virginia Department um, of Human Health and Human Services uh, daily map. Um, and that was outlined specifically um, with the charge from the state board. So um, all those students, and I'll get into some specificity here, uh, will be uh, returning uh, on for in-person at least two days. The reason I've highlighted at least two days is that if things gradually improve, we'd like to increase the number of days that students are attending for in-person instruction. So as opposed to bringing that back to the board, um, I could see us moving to four days and then hopefully five days here as we move into the spring. So for high school BRIC students, we're uh, restricted to follow the model that the state has provided. Uh, and for right now, in-person instruction for uh, high school students will be um, at least two days a week when the DHHR map is orange or better. Uh, and so as 
long as it's not red, or we can have high school students return. All right, let's talk a little bit uh, more specifically about pre-K-8 uh, and return to learn. And we made mention that it's uh, slated for at least two days of in-person. Uh, we're Monday is uh, the day that we provide um, nutritional services. So for students with uh, last name uh, A through K in the alphabet, they will be attending school on Tuesday and Thursday. For students L through Z, they will be uh, attending schools on Wednesday and Friday. Uh, Monday will be a virtual day for all students, uh, and that will also be our nutritional service day. We also recognize that some families, students may have a different, um, two different last names. Uh, we wanna hopefully coordinate those households. So we're gonna ask that the um, uh, families speak with their principals, make arrangements so students can attend school on the same day of instruction. And that's pre-K through eight. Moving on to high school. Uh, again, the alpha for uh, brick A through K will be Tuesday, Thursday, uh, L through Z, Wednesday, Friday. Monday is, we have five days in construction. Monday um, will be a virtual day. Um, for uh, the uh, students who are brick, uh, who will be attending school, uh, if we are orange or better, based on the West Virginia Department of Ed or, or West Virginia uh, Department of uh, Health and Human Services map, we will begin in-person instruction on Wednesday, uh, the 27th of January. I must note that uh, the 26th, as you heard earlier this evening, is a day when uh, PSATs are gonna be administered. So we will start, if students, if the map is not read, on Wednesday the 27th. We've given you the alpha breakdown, you're well aware of um, the uh, curbside meals and also cleaning that will go on on Monday. Uh, and then again, we'll ask families if there's a difference in, in uh, last names uh, that will speak with your principal and they'll try and get those schedules aligned. For students um, who are receiving learning support um, or special services. Uh, right now, for the remainder of this week, those students' schedules will remain the same and they will be attending school on Wednesday and Friday. Next week, though, we will work to for a four-day model uh, and um, staff will be reaching out to those families. It's a small cohort of students will be reaching out to those families and coordinating transportation uh, and their schedules for the week. We, we hope that we do not have to um, exercise. Oh, you're gonna have to go back. Uh, the closing of either classrooms or schools as we've done in the past, but that may be an alternative that we have to uh, pursue if there is an outbreak or we have a number of folks who are quarantined because of uh, operational needs. So there may be occasions here as we uh, begin to open schools back up that we will have some small closures or uh, of either classrooms or schools in particular. And we actually did that back in the fall. I had come to you earlier in the year and asked uh, based on working with uh, our uh, professionals um, for uh, time for teacher work day. We had one of those teacher work days slated on Wednesday, the 27th. I'm gonna ask that we have a change in our calendar so that that teacher work day can be moved to January the 25th. Uh, that will still be a, um, a virtual learning day for kids and they will do that asynchronous. Um, but we would like to move that teacher work day so we could begin the schedule here of the alternating um, uh, you know, um, group one, group two uh, next week and move forward with that. I'm still advocating a slow return. I still think we need to practice some of the key um, 
mitigation strategies that we've uh, reinforced all along, social distancing. That's why we're going with the AB schedule. Uh, if we split the number of students who are interested in uh, returning with brick instruction, uh, split those groups into smaller groups, um, we can then uh, make sure that we have a, appropriate distancing. Obviously, practicing hygiene. Mondays will be deep cleaning days for our school to do that. Continuing to wear face coverings uh, that has proven out to be something that is important. Uh, and then also the contact tracing that we have uh, through our offices with uh, pupil services. So that is um, the overview. I have a motion here that I would like to um, read. And if Mr. Kenny can put that motion up, uh, it is my uh, recommendation to amend Berkeley County's return to learning plan according to the mandate of the West Virginia Board of Education and West Virginia Department of Education, along with providing necessary flexibility to uh, myself to meet those requirements by including the following parameters. First, all pre-K 12 students will be provided uh, five days of instruction. Brick pre-K through K students will utilize a blended instructional model beginning Thursday, this Thursday, January 21st, providing each BRIC student with in-person instruction at least two days a week and with a balance of three days of asynchronous and synchronous learning. Pre-K or, or BRIC pre-K eight students will attend in-person instruction regardless of their county color on the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources map, county alert system, following the hybrid blended instruction. Brick nine through 12 high school students will continue virtual learning through Tuesday, January the 26th, in-person hybrid blending learning model with in-person instruction at least two days a week. Um, and where am I here, Mr. Uh, and uh, a balance of three days of uh, asynchronous and synchronous learning uh, at high school beginning Wednesday, January 27th, unless the county is red on the DHHR county alert system map on Monday and Wednesday. We'll provide more, more detail on that. Uh, essentially, we're gonna look at the map on Monday to determine if students can attend school on Tuesday. And then we'll look at the map again on Wednesday to determine if students can attend school on Thursday. If the map is red at any point in time, then obviously students cannot attend. Um, and this will hopefully avoid students coming and going in and out of school. Click uh, pre-K student schedules will continue to receive five days of, of, of instruction as I, I, I made mention. And then operationally creating the calendar change to allow the movement, movement of Wednesday, January 27th, an asynchronous day, and virtual learning to the teacher workday on June the 25th. Berkeley County Board of Ed and or superintendent re, uh, retains the authority to work with health officials to close individual classrooms and schools when specific health or operational needs related to that classroom or school arise. And then finally, with the distribution of vaccine and status of the community spread of the virus seems favorable, um, we uh, would revisit uh, the return to, uh, this return to learning plan. I will stop there. That is a wealth of information. As I made mention, depending on the board's action this evening, uh, we will be pushing messages out to staff. Um, we needed to move fast based on the uh, response we got from the uh, State Department, as well as from uh, the State Board of Education. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, have this lined up to begin on Thursday uh, of this week. The board's heard the motion as presented by the superintendent. Let's get it on the floor right now. Is there a motion to approve the motion to return to learn as presented tonight by Dr. Murphy? I move we approve the superintendent's recommendation with respect to return to learn as presented. Is 
Is there a second? Second. Motion by Mr. Beckwith, a second by Mr. Martin to approve the return to learn uh, outline as presented by and recommended by the superintendent to the board. Is there a discussion now? Uh, anyone else? Go ahead, I'll, uh, I'll start a couple of questions and a, a comment. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning I do look at the DHHR map uh, every morning, and I think I'm per, uh, correct in saying that uh, for Berkeley County, the percent positivity in cases per 100,000 has improved every day for at least seven days. So uh, although we're still in red, uh, we do have some hope that everything's heading the right direction. I do have two questions, uh, and just clarification, I guess it does tie into uh, nine through 12 and your earlier comment about athletics, I wanna make sure I understand. You, you gave the starting date for practice and games, but if high schools would, if the county's in red and high school's not in brick session, then their athletic, athletics will not be happening. I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer to uh, Mr. Dellinger who's here um, and he can speak to that directly because I know he works uh, with the Athletic Association on that. Yeah, Mr. Beckwith, you're, you're correct. If we're red, there cannot be any type of extracurricular participation if for our high schools if we're red. Okay, that's what I thought was, but I want to make sure everyone knew that was to be true. And then one, one other question, inclement weather uh, as of to complicate an already complicated schedule. We happen to have bad weather on Thursday morning or next one of the days that we have brick kids going to brick construction. What happens on those days? Do the kids stay and stay home and and go into virtual learning? Right. We'd be able to switch now that we have this ability. We'd be able to make that transition and make that announcement. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Beckwith. I want to just highlight one thing, and I think you're accurate in saying that the map is gradually. Um, you know, moving in the direction that's much more uh, positive for us to return as quickly as possible. But I just want to highlight for everyone's attention that you need to look at that over a period of time because what happens is they recalculate the numbers the day after. And typically the, the day report number is lower than when they recalculate it. I'm just, uh, you know, guessing how they're doing that. But the, the second day afterwards, that number goes up slightly, which is a little disappointing, but I'm not mm. running the numbers. I figured that, that out early in the game when I was every day being a mathematician, I was checking the state's numbers. And then I would often notice the day before my uh, number was different. So yeah, so thanks for pointing that out. And I, I just think that's a lag on the information coming in and, and they're, they just subsequently have to recalculate. So um, it's just a point of interest. Um, just for clarification for me, I, I heard Mr. Beckwith's question. High schools will not only not have, uh, will be prohibited from having athletics, but if it's a red day, grades nine through 12 will not even go to school. That, that's correct. That's what this, that's what the state's um, right. mandated report is, uh, or program is. Right, everything below the well, eighth grade and down will go to school, but- They're not driven by the map at all. Right, they're not- Their attendance. Thank you. Uh, first, I wanna compliment you and Dr. Queen for the letters that you, which you sent. They presented the case and the feeling that we, uh, we voted on on the 13th. Uh, the concern was safety. Uh, I, I too, uh, I was looking at your mitigation things there uh, about the mask. And I heard a, just about a half a dozen. I, I was talking to people up to the 13th and a couple of the uh, primary teachers and the pre-K teachers were expressing concern that the children must wear in those grades a mask to ride the bus to school, but not in class. And the teachers were expressing concern that it, that children at that age are very uh, uh, unhygienic. I'm not going to get into details, but uh, they were sharing they were sharing with me that their concern, especially the younger children on that level, 
And I was wondering, rather than offering a, a, an amendment here now, if, if your staff would go back to the primary schools and ask, do we need to extend the mask wearing of students down um, to the lower level? I've noticed a lot of small children out in public wearing masks. It's a two-way street. Even when we get the vaccinations, we're still until it's, I guess they call it herd, uh, herd whatever, immunity. We're still going to have to be wearing masks even after we've had the, uh, the uh, inoculations. So I'm just requesting that uh, you, you ex consider expanding the mask wearing and the mitigation process by going and asking the employees and the teacher aides in those levels, as well as the principals, if it would be wise to go ahead and start doing it. Um, I also, I'm glad we're not trying to go to court and challenge the State Department. We'd lose. I sincerely believe we'd lose. But I'm glad that uh, uh, we're emphasizing safety is our biggest concern for our children and for our staff in this community. And we just, we've been trumped by the authority of the state board. And I, I believe that we thought, some of us felt that that one sentence in the order on the 13th from the state board allowed us to do it last week. We were not flaunting the state board uh, mandate, as some people may think. We were sincerely trying to stay within these guidelines and also protect our community. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Is there any, one, any other discussion from the board? I think this is a good compromise. Um, I think there are a lot of our students that are falling further and further behind. This at least gets them in in front of their teacher a couple days a week. Uh, and they can go back those other two days, three days and, and work. Um, and then hopefully things will improve and we can be back in five days a week. I just have a quick question. Um, what if like someone, a student wants to switch from click to brick now um, after everything? Uh, we're gonna have to ask that, that to be looked at school by school because of how the master schedules are arranged. Um, some schools have some flexibility, others don't. So um, we, as we've gone through the year, we've looked at each one of those and tried to make some adjustments. I credit our principals for being able to do that uh, and make those accommodations. Thank you. Uh, my hope is that uh, when we go back to school, we can stay in school. I, I hope we don't see a rise in numbers uh, throughout the county, um, but I feel confident that people are going to abide by the rules uh, even more strictly uh, because of the widespread of the COVID-19 in this uh, school district. But um, again, uh, I think it's a good plan. I think it's a, a, certainly a compromise of full time. Uh, but I feel like we're going at it in as safe a manner as we can to abide by the state uh, mandate at this point. So um, I feel comfortable uh, going forward with uh, what we have. So thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Any other discussion? Well, we will be in a position to maintain the six foot distance by cutting down on the students, correct? I saw, I saw you mention that. In there. Right, I mean, that's, that's the whole intent of the alternating schedule or the group one, group two schedule. And exactly. It, and this is a point that was in that uh, January 13th school board meeting that they offered. It's not, I mean, that this is an option mm -hmm. they suggested as well. That's correct. Many right. other districts are adopting it, by the way. All right. Yeah. Well, this new return to learn plan was put together very quickly uh, and I think very efficiently by uh, the superintendent and the senior staff. Uh, which I think is there to be credited for putting this in place so that we could go back to school on Thursday. So thank you all very much. Any other discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion to return to school as presented, say aye. 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 Is there any opposed? The vote is unanimous by the board.
to accept the motion to return to learn as presented. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Item number four on the agenda is adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. A motion by Mr. Murphy, uh, a second by Mr. Beckler to uh, adjourn. Is there any discussion? Thank everyone for their participation tonight uh, throughout this meeting. Uh, we appreciate your time and effort. And I think we can move forward now from this. So thank you very much. All those in favor say aye. 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 aye.